What's up, everybody, and welcome to the Golf 360 Podcast. I'm the host, Pete Popovich. So you may be asking yourself, what is Golf 360? And Golf 360 is a show that was designed to introduce you to people associated with the game of golf to help you improve not only at your game, but also your life. Almost all of our guests are from within the industry in some way, shape, or form, but some of the guests we have are from outside the industry, and it mainly revolves around the business world with a few others scattered in here and there. Now, all of the guests that we have have a few things in common. One, they all were highly successful and accomplished in their field. Two, each has something to pass along that will help you in your game and your life. And three, they were all more than willing to give back by passing along the things that they used to help them in their career and even some of the mistakes that they made so that others don't make them in their journey. So I hope you find listening to them as enjoyable as I did interviewing them and that each and every one of you benefits from the information that they so willingly and graciously pass along. This podcast is brought to you in part by Just Thrive Probiotic. You may be surprised to learn that your digestive system is the key to creating and maintaining the quality of your physical, mental, and emotional health, and it's one of the body's most essential systems. That's why the majority of nutritionists today highly recommend probiotics as an indispensable nutritional supplement. As a discriminating consumer, you've probably been searching for a probiotic that is proven, potent, and effective, and you found it. Just Thrive is your best choice for maintaining a healthy lifestyle. Just Thrive Probiotic captures the power of hundreds of thousands of years of nature's design with a specialized bacillus strain formulation that guarantees survivability through the stomach and upper digestive system. Supports optimum gut health, digestive health, immune health, and delivers antioxidants. Great for adults, kids, and the whole family. Use promo code GOLF360 at www.thriveprobiotic.com for 10% off your This podcast is brought to you in part by Old South Golf Links. A short ride across a bridge from Hilton Head Island is one of the area's finest golf courses and a hidden treasure. Set up on towering pines and ancient oaks with sweeping march vistas truly makes Old South Golf Links a one-of-a-kind golfing experience. The Clyde Johnson design was named one of the top 10 new public courses when it opened, and it also takes full advantage of the natural beauty of the low country. Old South is a fun and unique challenge for golfers of every skill level and a favorite of both locals and visitors. Whether it's your first time here or you're a regular, you'll be treated and feel like family. From the bag drop to check-in at the Fully Stocked Pro Shop with both men's and women's apparel, to breakfast or lunch before or after your round, the staff is always ready and willing to help. Experience for yourself why Old South is one of the premier golf courses in the Hilton Head area and why it will quickly become a favorite of yours too. Visit them in person or online at www.oldsouthgolf.com or to make it tea time, simply call the Pro Shop at 843-785-5353. Today's guest is putting theorist Jeff Mangum. So if you're wondering why he's a theorist and not a coach or instructor, you'll find out later in the show. If you haven't heard of Jeff, I wouldn't be surprised if you struggle with your putting because he is probably the most knowledgeable person on the planet when it comes to to putting, green reading, everything you can think about. Uh, Over 20 years ago, he was an attorney and he used the same principles of preparing for a case in court where you research and read everything you possibly can about a topic before presenting it. Uh, to a judge or jury in order to win on behalf of the client. So Jeff has read and researched just about everything and anything written on putting from stroke mechanics to physics, uh, the eyes, putters and their design, greens, grasses, balls, you name it. And probably the most impressive and where he and I connected really well was the neuroscience in putting. Uh, Part of what makes him so knowledgeable is he turns over every stone to continue his learning whether it's a new putter, a training device out to the market, a different way of reading green, stroke theory, or something else, he will study it and research it to no end. And this is probably where he's rubbed the establishment the wrong way in that he has challenged the old way of teaching putting, and some are really put off by his presentation or his method or the way he goes about it. Even though he's just really trying to help, and you understand that once you get to know him or when you hear today's interview. There's one thing for certain. He knows putting better than anybody. Whether you like him or loathe him, you can't deny his knowledge. And because of that, he has my utmost respect. 
There was so much information we tried to pack into today's show, and we only scratched the surface. And I'm sure Jeff's going to have to come back so we can dive deeper into putting. Today was a starting point, so I trust you enjoy our conversation. Live with uh, Jeff Mangum, the putting theorist. Jeff, uh, (laughs) thank you a million for taking the time to come on the show. Sure thing, Pete. I am. I'm going to warn people up front, uh, you and I, when we talked the other day, just to get a brief idea of what we're going to talk about, that conversation lasted over an hour, so I'm, I'm sure today is going to uh, <laughs> not be short. So forewarning anybody who thinks this is going to be your typical 20 to 30, uh, 40 minute podcast uh, with, with the amount of information you have in your brain and what I've learned from you and picked up and teach and so forth, I'm sure this is going to be a lengthy one, but, and I'm sure we're going to have to do a couple more. So just forewarning the listeners out there. Just go keep it simple too. One thing I wanted to start with is that I thought was very unique and pretty cool. Um, your signature, uh, uh, whether you sign or respond to something, an email or so forth, uh, hit, uh, for a long time, and I, I think it still does, says putting theorist, uh, right. not coach or instructor or uh, guru or, or what have you, like some, some people might do. So can you just elaborate a little bit on where the theorist came about and, and the thinking you had behind that? Sure. Um, I was a lawyer for 15, 20 years, and then I quit. And then I had time on my hands, and I took up golf again, and I was about 38 years old. And the lawyer doesn't want to waste a lot of time uh, getting back up to the competency level. So I studied golf again at age 38 the way a lawyer might study uh, an alien field of expertise like airplane avionics. Airplane crashes, the widow comes and says, sue them, give me some money, my, they killed my husband. Yeah, I don't know anything about avionics. I don't know anything about electronics, uh, airplane control systems and all that. But within a month as a lawyer, I'm going to know more than anybody that ever designed or built or installed or operated one. And that's what lawyers do. They just go after it. You know, so they, they don't leave any stone unturned so they can actually know all the weak spots that somebody's expertise might have and that's that's kind of the way you win cases too you know you go after uh the defendants experts and the defendants lawyers and you know more about it than they do so that when they get around to the weak point in their case you just bust them wide open Mm -hmm. all right so studying golf like that um it takes about five years to gather everything together and sort it out What you want to do is you want to not waste time as you go through the materials. You want to read it purposefully. So what you do is you organize, first of all, why are you reading something? And that means identify what the skills are. So the way a person identifies what the skills are is they just ask a Martian to come down and stand off the side of a green somewhere and say, what are the skills that a golfer needs in order to putt well? And the Martian says, well, everybody that does a putt, they read a putt, they aim a putter, they stroke for line control, and they stroke for distance. So there are four things that everybody needs to do well. And you say, okay, then you go get all the literature in the world, all the books, all the articles, all the DVDs, all the VHS tapes, and then you start observing people. And in my case, I was spending uh, about 10 hours a day no, no, five hours a day and about 14 hours total, five on the green and then another nine or so reading and, and writing and studying different things. And that went on for about five, six, seven years when I had, was collecting everything. For example, there are about 150 books, most of which have been written you know, prior to 1970. Between 1870 and 1970, there's probably about 140 books on putting. Uh, the modern crew of golfers don't seem to write much. They don't contribute much back to the game. Uh, Arnold Palmer, Jack Nicholas, Ben Hogan, Byron Nelson, Gene Sarazen, Sam Snead, all those guys were prolific writers. They wrote lots of books and, and shared their sense of how things work, how you hold a, a driver, how you point the V at your shoulder, how you hold your head still, blah, blah, blah. And Hogan's Five Fundamentals and Elements of Golf, those books are great. Sam Snead's got a bunch of great books. Well, if you focus only on the putting books, there's maybe 140 of them, maybe another 15 since 1970. And all the magazines, the magazines 
the basically there are two in America, Golf Digest and, and Golf Magazine, both started in 1946 after World War II. And both of them are 12 issues a year. So from 1946 to 19, 2016 is a 70 year period. So 70 times 12 is however many issues there are to look at, which is a lot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? 700, 840 issues. If you stacked up 840 issues of Golf Digest on the library table, the stack is about um, four and a half feet high. And Golf Magazine, same thing, about four and a half feet high. Not quite as – Golf Magazine is a little thinner. I wouldn't but be if surprised you, if you've done that. <laughs> oh, I have done Yeah, I've done it more than once. And, and I'm taking notes, you know, all the way through. Uh, in fact, I've compiled all my notes in a 1,068-page uh, outline of everything that Golf has ever said about putting, um, which I freely distribute to people that want to get a copy of it. Uh, you can search that database with a um, the same way you search a, a document, the Word document. You go uh, escape, find, and then put in a term. For example, thumb. <laughs> if you put in the term thumb and you search 1,068 pages worth of uh, notes on the literature of putting, you'll get a bunch of articles and, and uh, stuff about what you do with your thumb. George Lowe in particular, the master, master of the art and science of putting, his book, written by Al Barco is uh, all about the thumb. So at any rate, five or six years into it, once you do all that reading, what you do is you throw everything into one of the skill buckets in a warehouse. It's, it's just piled all on the floor and you need to sort it out. Everything has to do with reading putts. You throw it in a big old 55 gallon barrel. And then everything has to do with aiming putters, you throw it in a barrel. Everything has to do with stroking for line control, you throw it in a barrel. And everything you, you find in the history of golf for distance control, you throw it in a touch barrel. And then then you're ready to start reading purposefully so that you, you, you stay organized. And if you look in the reading bucket, what you find is that um, there's a couple of people talk about pouring water on the green and how to read grain. And then read from behind the ball, read the break from below the, the putt, read the break from behind the hole. And then they don't have anything else to say. That's it. They're out of gas. Uh, that's the history of golf for reading putts up to about 2008, 9, or 10. Um, for aiming putters, it's uh, about all you got is stand behind the ball, use your dominant eye, maybe use the line on the ball. And then there's nothing. There's nothing about how you identify the target that you're aiming at. There's nothing about the perception process. There's nothing about dominant eyes, science, or any of that. So then you get to the stroke bucket, and it's just crawling with worms and and crickets and doodads and monkeys and frogs. It's like everybody's got an opinion on the stroke. Yeah, they're all trying to uh, reinvent the wheel. Mm Mm-hmm. And it's basically my daddy taught me this, or this is what I used, or I sat on a toilet in Chicago and wrote a book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, w- one of the top teachers in the modern era was Ben Harold Swash, and he basically was a worker in a, um, he was a clerk in the engineer's office. And uh, he missed so many greens of regulation that he chipped and one putted a lot, and he had a bunch of rounds of 18 putts. So he decided he was a putting guru. And uh, the only thing he ever taught was a, a certain setup and stroke motion to try to put true roll on the ball, but he didn't bother asking anything about what is true roll and what does it, how does it actually work. So the stroke bucket is, is like full of stuff. Stand up, he's got a stroke, you know, whatever. And then uh, you look into the touch bucket and you look, you stick your head down there, there's a little sticky on the bottom. And you say, what in the world is a sticky doing in there? You take the sticky off the bottom of the touch barrel and, and you read this little note from Paul Azinger in the 2010 US, uh, ABC broadcast of um, British Open. And he says, look at that touch by Tiger Woods. You can't learn that. You have to be born with that. <laughs> and so, so according to Paul Azinger, who is not known as a great putter ever, uh, don't bother trying to learn touch. There's nothing you can do about it except 
just hope your parents had good DNA and you got right. it too. You selected, <laughs> you came from the right gene pool. But, right, right. Hey, but before I want to get into your four skills, but I, sure. I don't want to, I don't want to tease, I want to kind of tease everyone into it, but not get there yet. Right. I, I, well, basically, you asked me why I'm a theorist. Okay. And the I'm answer, sorry. Right. The, that's okay. The answer is um, the Martian told me there are four skills. And then when I read the history of everything ever written in the history of golf uh, up to about 2005 or so, there's nothing in there worth talking about, about how the skills actually work. And so, and that's number one. I'm a theorist because I started deciding to solve these issues personally for the first time in the history of golf, somewhere around 1995, 98, I started working on that and I've been continuing researching it. The second thing about a theory is you got to know what is a skill a skill is not just an ability to do something. It's ability to know how you do it. And there's a knowledge component of the skill that people in golf don't seem to appreciate. I'll more about that later. The third thing about a theory is that you have to integrate each skill. Um, the reading of a putt is based on ball speed. You have to know a good ball speed. You have to be familiar with it. And you have to be able to imagine with it and predict with it. And then you have to be able to execute the same ball speed. If you can do that distance control skill and know how that works, then you can generate predictions of curves that are accurate. So reading a putt and distance control, those two skills are um, connected at the hip. And they're elusive and difficult and require a lot of learning skills and attention and knowing how things actually work. The other skills of uh, once you got a curve, there's a start line. That's where you aim. And once you got a start line and you've aimed your putter face, that's where the stroke goes for line control. Those are simple, direct, and um, they do require some knowledge about the body mostly. But they're not very complicated in terms of what's required for you to do. So the theorist is um, he has to know those four skills, has to know what is a skill, and has to be able to integrate those skills so that when you teach distance control, you understand that that's the foundation of reading putts. When you get a red, when you read a putt correctly, the line and the stroke are not optional. The aim and the stroke are not really optional. So that's pretty much what the theory is about. Um, there's other parts to it too, about how do you how do you be an effective teacher? What's how do you talk to people of different education levels and ages and experiences? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're, they're, uh, uh, I think uh, Dr. Howard Gardner from Harvard is one of the world leaders on intelligence levels, not how smart somebody is, but how they process information. Right. Uh, and you're absolutely right. I, I was fortunate enough to find out about him a number of years ago. Um, but yeah, you, you, again, you and I agree on a, a lot of different things, if not just about everything. Um, right. How did... Uh, how did you get into putting? You know, what, what was the fascination? Well, I, I, I hated law. I quit it. Um, I was pretty successful at it, but I just didn't want to continue associating with that class of people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're just not nice people. Um, I say that if you, if you take a CPA and suck all the life and imagination out of it, that's a pretty good start on a lawyer. <laughs> 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 so I just didn't want to hang out with those people. So, um, uh, fortunately I had a great marriage and my wife didn't mind if I did, did what I was doing. I basically spent a lot of time, uh, learning golf and doing different things, you know, just to make ends meet. But while I was doing golf, I mean, I really went nuts in terms of time and devotion, trying things out. Be stuff like, uh, you know, how you know, Bobby Locke did it. I would go get the old newsreels from the forties and fifties from England according to the path a news broadcast network and get the old digital movies of Bobby Locke putting and then read everything he ever said about it, track down everybody ever caddied for him or walk, walk around with him and read all the social history of, of Bobby Locke coming to the United States and beating everybody. And then I would work on Bobby Locke's stroke for a couple of years. <laughs> I mean, I, I would do it literally for a couple of years. I did uh, Gary player stroke for a couple of years um, a little stop and pop stroke. Mm -hmm. um, um, I did the uh, Horton Smith strokes. I did Walter Travis, um, Willie Park Jr., um, Ben Crenshaw, uh, Lauren Roberts. Those are the biggies. 
And I just basically did everything they said do for more than a year each just to see if I could kind of comprehend exactly what they were saying. So you kind of absorbed uh, to understand it better from an outside perspective, but in Yeah, absolutely. Plus, you know, experiment, try things out. Uh, did Jack Nicholas putting for a while. Tried some of the Arnold Palmer knock kneed head down stuff. Uh, studied Bob Rosberg. Rosberg was pretty good. Mm-hmm. So you, you, yeah. you would, and you would play golf. You're from North Carolina, so you know it's a warmer climate. You, you play golf as a kid growing up, or you didn't, or did you play? Uh, not just kind older? of late teenage years up to about college starting somewhere. You know, 18, 19 years old, then on off to college. Didn't do it again for a while. Mm-hmm. So there's about a 20 year gap from young age golf to um, reconnecting with golf at age 38. What was the gravitation towards putting as opposed to say full swing or wedge game or you know any other facet? Well, once I started you know reconnecting with the um, golf as a, as a set of skills, full swing, um, iron play, but trouble shots, course management, and putting. Um, it, it, it just was obvious that nobody knew anything about putting and that it was only like 5% of all the written material even brought it up. And the 5% was repetitive, inconsistent, vague, and stupid. So, um, when I looked at the full swing stuff, my first conclusion was, well, I'm not going to be the greatest ball striker in the world. And I'm not a big, powerful person that like a PJ tour player, six foot, two and a half. 235 pounds hits at 290, 300 yards on, on average. I wasn't going to do that. So I just picked whatever was there were, there were 40,000 different books on swing. You know, that's ridiculous. And uh, it's like 150 on putting. So path of least I, resistance, eh? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I it was in the, the nineties. And so, you know, the top dog in the nineties was uh, Faldo and um, Ledbetter. And Ledbetter had pretty books with pretty pictures and stuff. And so um, I read all the, the Hogan and the Nicholas and the Sneed and all those good stuff, you know. But uh, I was just trying to get through the swing stuff to get a minimal competence of hitting it. And I, I didn't actually get that for a long, long time. Um, I'm pretty good at swinging the driver now and swinging irons. I'm, I'm pretty straight, mm-hmm. pretty fairly powerful. And... Um, but it was just, you know, pick a piss, pick a basic swing guru and then go for it. I was too busy studying putting. Um, the fascination with putting, I guess, was nobody knew anything about it. It wasn't long before I knew more than anybody in the world's ever known about it. D- did you have any mentors, anyone that kind of helped you along in the early stages? No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> I had one guy that helped me play golf, but. Um, he was like a scratch golfer from his teenage years and he liked to go play golf. He was a lawyer. He'd go play golf in the afternoon try to find somebody to bet with. And, um, he was a little bit vain. Uh, he watched me grow as into the greatest putting instructor in the history of the game, but he would never ask me a question about his putting. <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? He would, he would send me to teach his kids and stuff, but he wouldn't take, he wouldn't ask me personally. We, we were playing all the time, me and him only for five hours a day. And he would not be putting well, and I'd just keep my mouth shut, and he wouldn't ask me. <laughs> eventually, one day, eventually, one day, uh, about this, this, this went on for 20 something, three years. And uh, eventually, he, he asked me a question on hole number six where he missed the six foot putt. He says, I can't seem to, to sink these puzzles. Tell me wh- what it is I'm, you know, what I need to know. I said, you're trying to aim, but you've never asked me how, so you don't know. And so you would best be served just quit aiming and hit it where you think it ought to go. <laughs> That's, yeah, keep it simple. And he immediately started sinking. You know, he was, he was, he thought he had, he had some kind of handle on how to aim a putter face at a target. Mm-hmm. Didn't know what he was doing at all. And it's basically a uh, uh, a 100-yard sprint runner tying his shoes together right before the gun goes off. (laughs) If you're not going to ask me how to aim, stop trying. That was the answer. (laughs) And he started immediately started sinking putts. But he didn't ask me how to aim. 
Do, do, do you think not? Do, do you think not having somebody show you allowed you to to expand more and learn more and, and do it your own way, t- taking well, your background as an attorney I didn't need and, and to using those skills? I didn't really need a live human being standing there telling me that they're better than me. Right. Uh, I knew that Horton Smith was better than me. And I sort of emotionally connected with Horton Smith. Uh, I emotionally connected with uh, Bobby Locke. You know, I've, I've connected with Walter Travis Jr. I've, I've gone to Garden City, Long Island and hung out, <laughs> in the, you know, sniffing the ghost of Walter Travis Jr. I've gone to the, the golf courses that he's designed and walked them, you know, living in his spirit. Mm-hmm. Um, so my mentors, are, they were dead, but I had their books and their articles. So, you know, I lived with them. Yeah, they were it, my mentors. Kind of what I get. You, you weren't pigeonholed by someone saying you need to do this. You, you had the uh, freedom to to do, do as you saw fit in search of a goal. Well, or, or to learn. That's, that's I'm a little more organized than that because I'm a theorist. Right. I was I was approaching golf first the way a scholar would approach a historical subject. First, you got to learn what everybody's already said about it. In addition to reading the the basic historical documents and records that are involved. So you know you got to gather everything that's ever been written about putting and put it in a pile and then read it personally to find out where things stand. Okay, not good, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> and it takes you five to ten years to, to learn that there's nothing in Dave Pell's, for example. It's, it's, it talks about putting, but he doesn't even talk about the four skills, and he doesn't talk about how you do it with your body. He says putt like a robot. Uh, he actually doesn't even know how a robot works. So reading all this stuff and seeing where things stood – I said, good Lord, this is a 500-year-old game with 150 years worth of written instruction. They don't know anything about putting. Is that really the case? And the answer was, yeah. Okay, so let's start from the beginning and attack each of these skills as a scientist would attack a skill. What would you need to know in science to learn how to read a putt or how to do distance control? There's some just some basic categories of sciences that pop up. For example, Mm -hmm. anatomy. (laughs) You need to know physiology. It'd be good if you knew something about perception processes and movement processes. Then you might want to branch out to um, motor skills expertise, how you make skills better. Then you might want to branch out to agronomics the design and maintenance and conditioning of golf greens. Why are they the way they are? What does that mean for putting? Then you might want to branch out to physics. Golfer swings club, club hits ball, ball rolls over grass, ball rolls in and interacts with hole. Those are all physics issues. So you want to know something about the physics. Um, I've been a lifelong student of physics, so that wasn't really a, challenge to me that was a, a just a fun opportunity to get into the physics um other things might be ergonomics how do you design tools for performance and you just throw up your hands and says good lord nobody in golf knows how to design putters it's terrible um so you bring these sciences to bear on investigating how the skill works in terms of the human body for perception and movement and then maybe intentionality and a little psychology, not much, but you keep asking the question, how do you read a putt? How do you do distance control? And for distance control, I've read at least 25 years of neuroscience from 1990 to today is almost 30 years. And it was the correct 30 because the the decade from 1990 to 2000 was uh, labeled the decade of the brain by the United States Congress, which funded almost all the research. Uh, During that decade, the human brain science advanced human knowledge about how the brain works as an organ of perception and movement by a factor of 50 over what was known in 1989. 
And then the next decade, um, 2000, 2010, the first decade was training four or five other researchers. And so the second decade, the amount of brain knowledge went up by a factor of about 200. So as we stand here today, the brain science has gone through the roof, maybe by 300 times more than we ever knew in 1989 about the human brain. It's gone so far that it's almost completely zeroed out psychology. Um, Sigmund Freud, for example, they quit teaching him in, in about 1990 because his stuff just didn't pan out. He was just making up concepts that weren't actually accurate. It didn't really work that way. Uh, words like subconscious, um, that's not a brain, that's not a neuroscience term. Uh, neuroscience defines aware in the mind or not aware in the mind. There's no sub halfway dark and shadowy awareness. It doesn't work like that. Um, how all the different parts of the brain connect, how the emotional brain connects with the, the logic planning brain, how um, perceptions come in and formulate the movements, how the perception habits shade and, and influence the movements, how the, movement habits are good or bad and, and, and make uh, different perceptions funny. That little seamless perception movement is called action in neuroscience. And so it's not really perception alone or movement alone. It's action, how the perceptions come through the brain and takes advantage of inherent capabilities, past experiences and all that sort of thing, biases and bad habits. And so, the theory part is to learn everything you could possibly learn in perception and movement by anatomy, physiology, psychology, and neuroscience, and apply that strictly to reading putts, doing distance control, and then doing aiming and doing line control. That's the, the big contribution that I bring to golf is up actually sorted out how these things work for instincts, how you read putts by instincts. I teach that, and I'm the first and only one that really does. How you uh, do distance control, how the body actually accomplishes that, what you do to operate your body as an instinctive championship animal, not as a human student. Uh, I'm the first person to crack that nut and can teach it to 10-year-olds. So that's the part that I'm, uh, I bring to golf. Um, I kind of have to claim my legacy because nobody really – much appreciates what exactly I've done about that. But before me, there wasn't, there wasn't any way to teach how to read a putt. Right. I, I remember when I was, I had a putting issue. It, it was the genesis of me putting together my putter fitting program. Um, right. and, and I would, that was in 2005 and I was searching the internet cause I had missed a Q school. I'd, I had an issue that year. I was lipping, averaging six lip outs around. I mean, it was almost to a point where guys mm. were counting. Right. Um, and I, I found, uh, your website and, and found a lot of great information on there that, that actually I used in, in, in the, in the building of, of the system that I have today, which now helps a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So yeah, mm -hmm. your stuff is, uh, I've always found it to be cutting well, edge and nobody else has distance it. distance control is really the, the, the part that transforms people's lives. Um, that's, that's the part that tour players don't really understand that. Uh, if you ask a tour player like Jordan Spieth, how do you do distance control? You kind of get a funny look. It's like I practice these drills. And you say, I, I didn't mean that. I meant how does it work? And how do you operate your body to do it well? And how do you operate your body to do it poorly? And you get a blank stare. Um, Ten-year-olds can learn distance control. Housewives can learn distance control. 18-year-old uh, kids can beat Tiger Woods at St. Andrews, Scotland where Tiger Woods in 2010 had five three putts in four days. And my 18 year old student with one lesson had one three putt in four days, second lowest amateur score in the history of the 150 year open. So, you know, um, how it works and how, it, how you explain it to a 10 year old, if that's not in your coconut as a golfer, you don't actually have skill. You don't actually have feedback. You don't have permanent steady improvement. And uh, whatever you think you're smoking, it'll last for a month or so, and then you fall back, and then you got to puff it back up to some sort of s treading water level of performance. Yeah, and, and you see that even at the highest levels, where, where the 
the peaks oh, and the valleys are up and down and up and down. And, and <laughs> you know, I sit there and I, it's, it's mind boggling that somebody in their camp can't get through to them. Maybe they don't well, know or they don't seek somebody out. But even the ones who are um, on the PJ tour in, in a period of 20 years from, uh, Let's see, 1986 to 2006, I studied every PGA Tour player that got on the PGA Tour. And there's about 2,000 of them during that time period. So um, every year, there's basically uh, an extra 100 that didn't have their name on the PGA Tour before. So over the course of 20 years, there's 2,000 players. Uh, 1986 to 2006 is a pretty substantial bunch of uh, top players in there. Um, but there are very few of them that actually got good and stayed good during their careers. If the criterion is, did you ever get in the top 10 and kind of stay there? And you make allowances if somebody had a, an injury for a year or something, but almost everybody else, they're coming and going like, like weeds in the wind. Uh, even Brad Faxon, who was a pretty good putter, he wasn't the greatest, but uh, he would one year he'd have a good ball striking year and his putting would fall way off. And then the next year he'd have a bad ball striking year, but his putting would be way up. And he would just come and go like the wind up and down. So if you if you ignore people like that, you say, who really got good and stayed good? And you look at 2,000 PGA Tour players, you get a handful of maybe 10 ever out of 2000 there's about f- maybe three or four at any one year on the pga tour who, who have good putting got good and stay good uh stricker was he's kind of like the old one of the old guys that got good and stay good mm-hmm. but what i'm telling you about these guys they don't know what they're doing they don't know why they're doing what they're doing what they're doing is one thing only um Ben Crenshaw has been doing one thing only since he was a kid. Um, he has a very leisurely tempo. Uh, he draws the putter back to the inside. Uh, he, he, he delivers the putter straight down the line with the rising uh, left shoulder that raises the putter straight over the line. So it's, it's like inside down the line stroke. Mm-hmm. And he can't describe it because he, he misdescribes it all the time. Um, People think that he goes inside to inside and that he kind of hooks putts and all kinds of stuff like that. And he doesn't, uh, he's inside down the line guy. And you can see that in any photo you take of him with the putter face, two feet past impact down the line. If you're from the hole, looking back towards his body, you'll see that, uh, his putter is, is hewing straight above the line in a vertical plane through in the through stroke. Bobby Locke had the same kind of thing. And people always say, oh, he hooked his putts. Uh, boys and girls, you can't hook a golf ball on the ground. That's bowling. The only way you can uh, make a, a bowling ball have the correct spin is because it has holes in it for your fingers to, order to throw the spin into it. A hook spin is a bullet spin. It's spinning like that. It's not like a top spin where the ball is sitting on the ground spinning in place, you know, around the equator. Mm -hmm. There's there's like three spins. One is the spin of the, of the, of the ball rolling towards the hole that sort of don't wobble kind of plane. Then there's the top where the ball is sitting on the ground spinning. That's cut spin or side spin, but bowling and hook spin That's a bullet spin, like a bullet coming out of a rifle. You can't do that with a putter. So, boys and girls, uh, Bobby Locke did not hook his putts. He putted from the inside with a hooded face, and then through impact, he went up, down the line, square face. So he's inside, down the line guy. Um, Stuff like that. You know, you, you look at what everybody in golf has ever done, and you don't really listen to them very carefully because they're not very good at describing what they do. But you try to make sense of what has worked pretty good, and then you sort of match it up with the science of how does the body work, um, how does the neuroscience working good for this or that, is it, is it good? 
what would be better what would be better to tell somebody you know to improve their golf um crenshaw could probably have been 20 percent better but he didn't know certain things um lauren roberts does one thing which is he does a shoulder stroke uh and he's been described as um having a very weird tempo um, most PJ Tour players have a tempo that's about 700 milliseconds, so 700 thousandths of a second backswing, and then about half that to impact or less. And uh, a pendulum of a human body swinging the arms and the putter is closer to a thousand milliseconds. That's because the, the the length of the putter and the length of the arm are closer to it. It's just physics, to, to a, right? To a it's, meter, we it's talked how about bodies that the other day. Right. Physics. That's right. But Lauren Roberts, uh, he was put on a Sam Putt lab, and they said, my Lord, your tempo is 950 milliseconds back. The backstroke only is 950 milliseconds. And then from the backstroke to the top of the follow-through is another 950 milliseconds. <laughs> and they're going, that's weird. And, and you know, all of, they couldn't, people at Sam Putt lab don't know anything about golf because they're not golf teachers. They're not, they don't understand strokes. And they don't understand human bodies. They just made a gizmo. And the gizmo that they measured most people with was 700 milliseconds back and 350 the impact. And Lauren Roberts was 950 milliseconds back and 475 the impact. And um, they said, well, that's weird. And they wouldn't, you know, nobody thought it was good. Well, Lauren Roberts got way better distance control than the other people. And Ben Crenshaw, with his leisurely backstroke, he says uh, the following sentence. This, you dig through everything Crenshaw's ever written, you can find one sentence worth writing down. Once I start the putter back, the stroke seems to complete itself. Now, he's a 70s guy, but he's, he's, he was taught by uh, Harvey Penick, who was a 50s and 60s teacher. And in 50s and 60s, the, the dominant theory of putting was let the putter head do the work and that's golf speak in the 19th hole by people drinking beer talking that means let your arm swing free fall through impact and let the, let gravity just move your putter and your arms well that's what crenshaw was doing he threw it back with that leisurely tempo and then his arms fell through impact with that leisurely tempo and that leisurely tempo, just as a matter of physics and human physiology, is about one second back and one second through or 1,000 milliseconds back and 1,000 milliseconds down and through to the end of the stroke. And people in golf, I've never heard of anybody trying to say, well, Ben Crenshaw is such a great putter. Why don't we try doing what he does? Yeah, it's mind boggling to me that throughout the industry, and, and I'm not in many others not that maybe you come across people in other industries but that, that they'll sit there like like you mentioned where everyone's trying to model after the 700 and i said well how'd you come up with it well right, the, right. And, and their answer is well that, that's what most of the best people are doing so that, well, that's, that's what, what we most model of the average off. that's the average of most of the guys and you and you want to say not to the them, best at all right so you want to say to them you're trying to pass this off as uh quote science to to the general right. public and you don't. You just came up with a generality to say, well, well, here, here's what well, here's what the average is. So here, here's what we're going to come up with. And you just shake your head and say, you're out of your well, mind. Well, they're actually doing it um, because they don't know how to teach and they don't know what their numbers of their technologies are good or bad. They can't tell a good stroke from a bad stroke because they don't know anything about strokes. So people who design technology run, run, run. <laughs> they're selling something. And it might be expensive and it has bells and whistles and computers and all kinds of stuff. But fundamentally, they don't know what they're doing. They get numbers, but they don't know good numbers from bad. And they don't know how to tell a golfer to change bad numbers to better numbers. And so what they do instead is they say, uh, you know, instead of you just keep pointing that out to everybody in the world relentlessly until we go out of business, we're going to fake it and we're going to make a model. We're going to go get 100 tour strokes, five each. So we got 500 tour samples, and then we'll give you the statistical average of that stroke. And then we'll tell everybody in the world, copy this, and that's what good numbers are. 
Yeah, it, that, it's that's not how that works. No, there's nothing empirical behind it, and and yeah, people, that's not and, how it works at all. And, and that's one of the problems I have in the industry is well, well, there's two. One is they tell people, well, you you got to practice it more. Okay, you're practicing the wrong thing; they're not going to get better. And the other one is is the you overuse of the word science. Right. And if you, I always ask other teachers, and I maybe I piss them off. But I don't care at that point. <laughs> I, I, I usually get to a point where they already irritate the hell yeah. out of me, and they'll say this is science. I'll say, okay, which one? And <laughs> and you've been around golf long enough to the, the big ones today are either physics or biomechanics. And I say, okay, what about um, neurology? What about uh, 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 neurophysics? What about ophthalmology? What, 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 I mean, you can go through a litany of them, right? And then I say, okay, right. which yeah, one? Sure. If you have a, uh, a for a certain individual. Which one supersedes the other if one of them isn't working? And right. <laughs> then I really get some crooked looks. But yeah, I mean, uh, I, I can go on for hours on that one, but that, that, well, that's a the, podcast me, me for another you, time. Uh, let me give you another one on physics real quick. Um, nobody in golf knows what true role is, and it's like a, a, a two minute Google. <laughs> you can get the physics of true role. And it comes out in a real simple little formula. Um, what changes skid to roll is the crash friction. Mm -hmm. And there's a formula that says when the skidding is completely changed over to only rolling when true roll happens. And I've never met anybody in golf that's actually Googled that issue and found out what that number is. The number is whatever velocity the golf ball has when it first engages the grass of the green and starts to feel its friction, whatever velocity that is, and let's just make up a number, 100 inches per second. Whenever the grass has reduced that number to 70% of its starting value, and in this case it would be down to 70 inches per second, no more skidding, only roll from that point forward. All right. So it's stupid. It, 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 you could just find it out if you just Googled it and take about two minutes to learn it. But nobody at Titleist or Yes Putters or Callaway or Paul Hurian and Quintic Putters or Sam Putt Lab and all these people that do putter fittings and they're saying, well, this putter has better true role than that putter. They're complete numbskulls. The putter doesn't have anything whatsoever to do with that 70% reduction that the grass friction does. The putter might give you backspin and might give you forward spin, but they don't know as scientists, they're not, they're just terrible. They're bad scientists. They don't even look up the physics. They don't look at their data. They can't think about their data and they're not even the right purpose of looking at the data is to understand how the phenomenon actually works but they're just trying to sell stuff. And so what they do is they miss this one thing about the putter face that gives it backspin versus the putter face that gives it forward spin. If you've ever looked at any of their actual uh, multi-frame pictures of, of this putter versus that putter, they'll have one that takes 18 frames to get the true roll, and then they have one that takes 12 frames to get the true roll. And they'll declare the one that got the true roll in 12 frames is a much more valuable putter, so buy that one. The truth is that a backspin putter um, at 45 degrees backspin is converted to 45 degrees in forward spin by the grass in the first two inches. And after the first two inches, there ain't no difference between putter A and putter B. The thing that they also ignore is... Um, Putters, certain putters hop balls into the air off the putter face. Mm -hmm. And all these numbskulls, and I mean, these people do not know any science whatsoever. Their name is Paul Hearing is one of them, and Quintic Putters, and Christian Markard at Sam Putt Lab do not know diddly squat about putters, putting, physics, or any of this. But they include in their multi-frame pictures of, of what happened, the ball in the air when they're judging the skidding. Balls in the air are completely irrelevant to skidding. And if you know anything about balls in the air, if you hit a ball with 45 degrees backspin, the backspin also does not change while it's in the air. But they don't know that. So they include the backspin in the 18-frame bad putter 
line of images. There's there's like five inches where the ball is is in the air hopping, and it and then once it engages the green, the backspin any backspin that was coming off the face of the putter face is washed out in two inches, and then you can you should be comparing apples and apples from that point forward only, but they don't do that. Um, it's even worse than that. Paul Urian is basically working with one putter company and then he goes out and pretends that his company Quintic is an independent scientific organization and it, he's not independent and he's not scientific and what he says is the people I work for they win the race they have the best putters to so buy that one he's done that two different times two different putters <laughs> so you know shame on you boys stop people need to blow the whistle and uh, point at you did, did you plan, uh, when you got into putting 25 plus years ago, did you plan on getting to this level or was it one well, stone I knew turned pretty over, quick turned into another one and so years, on? Yeah, I knew pretty quick that I was more knowledgeable than anybody I'd ever read of or heard of. I mean, that wasn't a problem. I mean, I knew I'm a pretty good uh, oral communicator because in legal practice, I was like the top um, criminal appeals attorney, brief writer, and oral argument guy in our North Carolina Supreme Court of anybody in the history of the state. Uh, my first year, I had 20 cases, and I won 16. That's 80% win record. Um, Harvard lawyers, Yale lawyers, they would strain their whole life to get to 25%, but I was 80%. And then I had a lifelong average of about uh, 55%. Mm -hmm. So that's better than anybody that's ever even tried that. So I'm a communicator. I can write. I can talk. I can persuade, I can make sense, I'm logical. And so somewhere around 1998 or somewhere, I said, good Lord, I know more than anybody that's ever lived. There isn't anybody in the history of the game that even says they've read everything. <laughs> I've actually <laughs> read it more than once. I, I don't just read it, I own it, I live it. I, or I walk out on the green for years with it. So... You know, there, there isn't any question that I know more about it than anybody's ever lived. It's just sad that I have to be the one to explain that to people. But I realized that fairly early on. The question was, was I going to try to teach it? Um, I spent 10 years without charging anybody to try to learn how to be a teacher before I charged anybody anything. And then as soon as I started charging people, um, I ran into the PGA of America. <laughs> they don't want any competition and I've had some very unpleasant experiences over 25 years with PGA of America people you're not welcome here go away there's very few you're one of them uh, I would say that of, in America if there's 15,000 golf courses with a PGA Tour uh, pro man in the desk inside mm -hmm that um, it's well below 1% that, are, that would welcome me. The rest of them are just set on uh, antagonism because that's the PGA way. Well, I, if you're not I PGA, think, you can't come in. I think it, to, to some extent uh, there, there are cracks in that armor, right? I, I don't well, think, there is a I don't little bit. Butch Harmon's in the like PGA. Kind of like the younger guys cracked it. Right, and, and there's a few guys that I know now who are uh, good teachers, um, Full swing mostly, and, and some short game guys who, who uh, are not in the PGA, and, and they, well, didn't, they didn't see the PGA's benefit. PGA has been losing their grip on the reins of golf because they kind of basically golf in the seventies was uh, twelve and a half percent of America played golf, and that was twelve and a half percent of two two hundred million. That was twenty five million golfers today. If there's twenty five million, I don't know. It's probably twenty four. But of 320 million Americans today, that's that's about seven and a half percent. So from 12 and a half to seven and a half, that's not called growing the game. That's 40 percent of it went walking. Right. That, that, there's definitely an issue there. Yeah. So the owners of the golf courses kind of started to realize that the PJ is not all that great. And um, then there was kind of like a, the Internet explosion allowed other people to get into teaching that wouldn't otherwise be allowed to. I mean, I've got, you know, parents of golf kids that have been studying the swing 
for decades, no more than almost, you know, lots and lots of PGA teachers. The curriculum that they teach down at Fort St. Lucie and the PGA of America for full swing is plain Jane, cookie cutter, vanilla. Now go do your weird stuff and make yourself famous with X Factor and uh, stack and tilt and, you know, put a marketing name on something and see if you can make a buck. And the rule is nobody in PGA will ever say anything negative about your weirdo stuff. But if you're non-PGA, attack, attack, attack. <laughs> yeah, and it, it, it's it's too bad because it. I mean, th- there are good guys in the PGA. A lot of them. There, there's good guys outside like yourself. And it, it, if, might if be. it's for the benefit might be. of the I, game, I'm not. I'm not meeting lots of them. I'm. I'm seriously telling you that that you and the, the guy over at the Golden Bear. Uh, one guy in Florida, two two guys. There are two guys in Florida that welcome me on their golf courses. Um, Florida's you know a big state. <laughs> yeah, a lot there's, of golf courses in Florida. Yeah, yeah. But uh, there's there's only really two where the director of instruction says, "Hey, yeah, sure, come on." Maybe maybe three, maybe three. And in North Carolina, uh, I've been living here you know my whole life. I'm 66. And when I started all this in 1990, it took me four years of knocking on the same two doors to get PGA of America, the top two teachers in Greensboro, North Carolina, to let me even talk to them for 15 minutes. It took me four years of repeat visits, knocking on the doors. Do you have 15 minutes? Can I talk to you about what I've been learning? It would be a very interesting conversation. You know, four years for both of these guys. (laughs) <laughs> it was horrible just horrible and and i moved out of greensboro about six years ago and lost whatever relationships i had slowly built up i had built up relationships at two golf courses in greensboro <laughs> hmm. one one in randolph county which is uh, todd hill's next county down and one in greensboro where the um one of the guys that took four years to let me talk to him I taught everybody on his golf school. He has a golf school at the back of a driving range. I get along with him, but the pros in the pro shop, they're complete jerks. Even even if I've been there 20 years, total jerks. When when you're at the level that you are with all the research and reading and you know, we're pushing three decades of your study, mm-hmm. um, when, when you come up with an idea or uh, you're developing another theory on, on something as it relates to putting, right. Uh, do, do you do you rely on anybody or who do you bounce information no, off of? I can't, I can't. Everybody in golf that thinks they know science, they know numbers and only numbers, and they don't know the difference between numbers and facts. Mm-hmm. Science is about facts. Number is, is, is depends on how accurately you measure something, but the brain and, and instincts, they work with facts. Um, it's kind of like Arnold Palmer got it right when he said situational golf. Um, the brain is a pattern recognition machine. It, it recognizes patterns. And by recognizing a pattern of a break and a contour and a green speed and a distance, it's going to invoke the right uh, instinctive uh, size of the swing and the force of the swing just by the wiring, the instinctive wiring. But you got to drive the pattern recognition system. You got to do that on purpose. All right, so real science is numbers are approximately right and models are approximately right and might give you some insights by some funny little factors in the equations. And But, but basically, that's not how science actually probes how things work. The function of science is to learn how the phenomenon works reading putts or distance control, whatever you want to say. And just chasing numbers, for example, David Orr is one of the worst on the planet for this. He's got a Sam putt lab machine, so he gets numbers. And then he says, if I have more numbers than you, I'm a better scientist than you. And you say, okay, well, David, what do you teach? He says, well, every golfer is different. I said, well, what do you teach? He says, every golfer is different. <laughs> he say, what do you teach for, for uh, the stroke pads and, and face control? He says, every golfer is different. 
<laughs> you're like going, well, what is it you do when you work with somebody with this so-called science? And he's, he's basically saying, you show me how you do it, and I'll show you how to do it cleaner with fewer mistakes, but I'll clean up how you do it. That's not teaching improvement. Uh, the, in the putting zone, what we do is we change golfers' lives. We take them from the bottom and we put them at the top. One lesson, one lesson. We have phenomenal record of one lesson change people's lives. What David Orr is doing is just fiddle farting around with numbers to make somebody's little so-so pattern of doing something cleaned up a little bit. It takes them a year or two years to do that. Stupid. So he doesn't actually know science. He's bad. But people who love science, love numbers, they 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 they're just the worst. And I can't I can't get around this enough. Uh, Aimpoint fell in love with a physics professor who made a model of putting. A model of putting means you can't get real numbers because real facts are messy and take a lot of measuring and they're not the same facts from a on the green to b on the green they change slope green the grass changes uphill downhill change you know and so facts are messy and they're approximate uh, numbers they're not exact numbers but a model says can't deal with it and so they assume away all the irregularities of facts and replace them with whistle clean model numbers Every surface is one flat slope. The slope percent is known to many decimal places. The green speed is known and is completely homogeneous from ball to hole. No putt is hit with any skid whatsoever. No putt is ever hit with any hopping whatsoever. All putts are hit center face, square, perfect distance control. The arrival speed of the ball is the highly most ideal theoretical slowest ball possible for the widest hole possible for the ball hole interaction. And so models are just, why do you bother doing that? You physics guy, you don't know putting, you don't care about putting. And so uh, nobody in physics cares that he wrote a, a paper on golf and nobody in golf cares that he wrote a paper on physics. And, and the end of the physics paper says, I don't know about you, but, uh, in my own personal experience, none of this has helped a bit. <laughs> That's the last paragraph of the guy who wrote a physics paper on putting. Well, Aimpoint took all that and didn't know the difference between numbers and facts. And they didn't know that the ball speed was too slow. And they didn't know that all the calculations were not real. They're models. And they didn't know that all the calculations were too high because the ball speed is too slow. And this and that and this and that and the other, they created a little booklet and said, you tell me the, the slope and the green speed, and I'll tell you where to aim. Well, that's not a skill. <laughs> that's not a skill. The skill no, is that, not that's looking it up by in numbers. the book. Yeah, it's like look it up in the book and let somebody else tell you. All right, well, that little booklet didn't work too good, so they created the finger-pointing aim point express. And I just spent all day today looking over years worth of Adam Scott's putting, and he's terrible. There's 205 players on PGA Tour, and he's down in 195 on the first eight or nine different measurements of, of putting between four and ten feet. He's terrible. He's just absolutely terrible. <laughs> he's For some reason, he's good between 10 and 15 feet. But other than that, he's, he's terrible. He's like a 205th, 195th, 137th, 156th, 185th. And, and that's the way he's been for years. Well, that's aim point. Aim point is you hold up a finger and tell you, no, you, you tell us the slope with your ankles and we'll tell you how many fingers to hold up. All right. Now that's not a skill either. That's just a little different thing without the book in your back pocket. Right. And we talked about that. What if your finger width is different? What, what yeah. that your finger's <laughs> a taper, which part of your finger right. are you going to use? It's like, okay, if it's an exact, right fitting or well, reading system how, how come it's an inexact measurement that you're having I've tried to help all these number of people i've always tried to help them to stop making mistakes and so i've critiqued aim point i critiqued the physics paper i think aim point actually got the physics paper off of my website because i'm only i'm the only crazy fool in golf crazy enough to read the canadian journal of physics and and laugh about it on my website but <laughs> 
you know, the the Sweeney guy at Aimpoint, he took it in and didn't know the difference and made the Aimpoint system. First time I met him, I met him uh, at uh, Hamilton Farms in New Jersey. And I said, you do know that there's an old uh, scientist, computer programming, engineering, physics colonel in the Air Force that wrote a 200-page book about all this in 1984, don't you? <laughs> Colonel no, you never heard of it. Templeton's book. Yeah, Templeton's yeah. Vector Putting, Vector the art putting. science of reading greens and computing break. And this is 200 pages of how the rolling ball on the slope has got a tilt in the center of gravity downhill. And that's like um, if you have a spinning um, front bicycle tire with two axles with your hands on the two axles and you push down on the left one mm -hmm. it doesn't lean the tire it turns the tire to the left so that's the rotational um the conservation of angular momentum is is involved in that little experiment they do in physics classes but templeton's got page after page after page about the actual physics of green friction green's agronomy Heights of grass, lowness of mows, and rolling stumps, and all that. And then he talks about the actual physics of why the ball curves. And, and then he does computer simulation programs about when it curves, how long it's, it's uh, staying over a certain slope. And then as it slows down, it stays longer over a given slope. And so the slower balls break more because they're spending more time on the slopes. And he does computer simulations of all this kind of stuff. And then he creates a whole system of zero break line, which today we call the fall line, the straight uphill line through a tilted flat surface that does not break. And then he made like a clock position around the hall. Uh, 612 is the zero break line. Eight o'clock position is the ball going to break left to right uphill. Five o'clock is going to be the opposite uh, four o'clock is opposite eight o'clock and it'll break right to left uphill, not left to right. That's a spider grid, isn't it? Yeah. Spider grid. Yeah. And, uh, so I, I was like, explaining all this to Sweeney and Hamilton farms. I think it was in 2008 or nine, never heard of it. So I gave him a copy and I said, look, you know, what's the point of aim point? If you're, if your numbers are bad and your aims are too high, number one, number two, it, it's not a skill. People are supposed to learn skill when they play golf. That's the whole challenge. You go out there and see if you can do it. Okay, you want to write funny scores down? Well, just have somebody else shoot your shot. Write it down. If you give somebody an aim, but you don't know how to aim a putter face, and you don't know the perception process of standing beside the putter looking down seeing where it aims, what, what's the point of giving them an aim from the booklet or a finger aim? If you don't know how to teach people to putt where their putter face aims, 90% of them are aiming to the right, pulling to the left. If you don't putt where you aim, why are you giving them aim? And if you don't do the distance control that matches the aim in your book, you can't teach that. What's the point? And, you know, they're like going, we hate you, we hate you, we hate you. <laughs> so anybody who takes a class from me, uh, they, they need to be forewarned that Aimpoint has got in their little teacher contracts with professionals, pros, uh, teaching pros, that if they take a class from me, they're going to automatically be kicked out of the Aimpoint. That's kind of mean-spirited, low-level stuff that I'm dealing with. I'm trying to help these people not hurt golfers. All right, so golfers who take Aimpoint, they think, I can stick my finger up, and it's good, and it's science. And I don't have to learn anything for skill about how to read putts. I just do my ankle, stick a finger up, and I'm skillful. And they stop. With a number of people, and you've touched on a number of them, uh, uh, the conventional sort of traditional uh, instruction or science or, or what have you, um, right. that, that, that disagree this with you. Repeating. Right. That, that they, and and it, it goes against your, your ideas and so forth on putting. What what have you learned most from from those that you disagree with? The people that, that I, I mean, what have I learned from them? Yeah, just, <laughs> you know, if, like, if you like learn something from every situation, right? If you learn something, every, whether it was oh, you know, well, what to do or not to do, I learned, that, um, I learned from Pels that you can lie about your research, and if nobody knows where your research is, you can get away with it. 
he, he's never had any research that says 17 inches past the hole is the correct way to do distance control. He's never had that. And I've actually found his research and read it, and what he says is there's no such number. He actually published an article in 1977 that said, my research shows there's no number for the, the right touch to go past the hole. That it depends on the green speed and the kind of grass it is. And if it's bent grass and tournament quality condition, it's 5 to 10 inches past the hole. And if it's Bermuda grass and, and not so good quality condition, it's um, 30 to 40 inches past the hole. <laughs> 30, 40 is quite <laughs> a bit. That's research in 1977. So he started telling a whopper in 1983. He said that he had scientifically proved that 17 inches past the hole was best for all putts. And he has no research that ever said that, and his own research says the otherwise. And so it's fair and free to say that he's lying about it because he's in print saying that what he said in 1983 is not correct. And what he says in 1983 is completely at odds with what his research shows. And that's kind of bad science. That's, that's kind of, that'll get you kicked out of a scientific convention. <laughs> that'll get you kicked out and don't ever come back. Let's uh, let's so, move on to to, to your the, the, what is I would guesstimate. Sure. You, you correct me if I'm wrong. Sure. You, you, your your system, sure. which is the the building blocks of yours, is is the four skills of putting. Right. So I, and I want to uh, I'll, I'll I'll let you go ahead and and, and describe each well, and, okay. and go into them. It's basically, reading a putt is predicting the curve. Aiming the putter is identifying the correct start line of a curve. Stroking where aimed is what What else would you do if you're not going to stroke it where you aim? 90 degrees off the putter face, or why bother reading and aiming? And distance control is must have the same pace imparted to the ball when you put where you're aimed as used to predict the read curve to begin with. So everything circles around to distance control. What is a smart ball pace? is the pace of the ball when it finally arrives from hither and yon at the hole. Okay? A smart ball pace is not short. When it crosses the hole, it has a wide hole, has a wide opportunity to go down in the hole before it hits the back wall. And so it goes deep in the, in the hole, and it can catch corners left or right of the hole where, you're, you know, the hole is a circle. So if you go off center, you're, your crossing paths suddenly become shorter. So it's slow enough to catch those side paths. And if you miss the hole altogether, it's slow enough so that it rolls two, three, four more times and then stops within two feet of the hole for an easy comeback. And in physics, um, basically for today's green speeds, a ball that is rolling um two revolutions per second is about the slowest you would want at the front lip of the hole. And a ball that's rolling about four revolutions per second, maybe five or six, is about the worst you would want for the fastest speed. And when I say two revolutions per second, I'm imagining that you can go in your mind one Mississippi, and while you do one Mississippi for a tick-tock of a second, you twirl your finger, your index finger, about as big as a golf ball twice. One Mississippi. Three Mississippi is you do it three times while you say one Mississippi. And four Mississippi is you do four of those while you say one Mississippi. If you have the ability to deliver the ball at the hole with that speed consistently, that's called the smart ball speed, not a personal ball speed. It's physics smart. It's more than, than, it's never short, and it's never long, and it has a wide hole for capture. Now, that being a smart ball speed, the question is, can you putt it? Can you do that? And in my neuroscience studies of, of how the body actually does distance control, the answer is, yeah, you take a class, you can sure do it. Housewives can do it. Kids can do it. Professional golfers don't know how to do it because they think they already know. But you have to operate your body. And that'll be what I'll describe in just a minute as monkey cow. First you go monkey, 
stop, stop, stop where you want to stop. Animal intentionality, paying attention to everything that counts. And then cow is you make a pendulum swing with an even smooth tempo twice rhythm. And the size of the swing instinctively happens adjusted to the space. That's instinctive. The brain intentionality puts you on high alert to select the right pattern. And the right pattern is already instinctively wired to how big and how strong the swing is going to be to fit to that space. Right. It's like That's most people, yeah, that they come out and they say, well, I have no distance. I, I can't control distance. I soak. And I'll, I'll, while they're talking, I'll toss them a ball and I say, throw it back. And they're talking and I back up and I throw it and they throw it back. I said, your distance control is fine because you hit me every single time. So we yeah. have to find out what, what kind of article they read or video they watched that, that got in the way. But you're exa- I, I agree with you 100% that people have that. Well, what, what they do is, um, you know, I mean, I've, been, I've been doing the teaching for about 20 years, and, and, and people are really bad at knowing what their tempo is, and they're really bad at knowing what an even rhythm is back and through. Mm-hmm. They can't match it up. All right, so if you, if you put them on task and say, look, you know, your tempo's a little quick in the backswing and a little slow in the forward swing or vice versa, and so your rhythm is not even, even, and your tempo is, is wrong anyway because it's not a nice, relaxed cow tempo, your body um, throws your arm away from you all the time when you're, like, reaching for stuff and pointing at stuff and walking. You throw your arm away, and gravity brings it back. And when gravity brings it back, it is always the same physics tempo because it's a stick on a pivot. An arm is a stick on a pivot. You throw it away, okay, well, question what muscle energy you use and how fast you threw it, but once it comes back, it ain't up to you. That's that's the, the world, the big rock of the earth pulls your arm back with tempo. And the tempo that of that action, which is probably about half of all your leg and arm movements, that happens thousands of times every single day. Ever since you've been your same body size, uh, three, four thousand times every day, your brain experiences that tempo. And in the course of growing up from age five or six, you learn how much energy throws the mass of your arm to reach to a doorknob or to point your finger at somebody's eyeball or to point your finger at their elbow or their knee or to reach for a glass of water on a table. All of those wirings are instinctive because they're non-conscious. There's no problem solving. It's just pattern recognition of what it is you intend to do. Reach for a doorknob. Reach for a glass of water. Point to somebody's eyeball. And as soon as you make that intentionality to the space, your brain is already wired up to the energy of the muscle that throws the mass of the arm correctly. Right, that's my contribution from neuroscience to golf. You're welcome. <laughs> Twenty five years of digging stuff out of the books. You're welcome. A lot of a lot of books is fun, you know, but you ain't done it, I did it. Mm-hmm. All right. So what happens is you need to appreciate how educated the body already is to actual physics in the external world. This is not commonly known even in neuroscience. Um, there's a guy that wrote a book in neuroscience called The Brain's Sense of Movement. And you think, okay, well, he's going to have the sentence in there that the brain is, is uh, wires up the external physics into the body. And what he says is somehow or another the brain knows how gravity times falling objects. <laughs> and you go, okay. You don't have to know that the, the arm is a pendulum, the legs are pendulum. You don't know any of that free fall stuff because you're a neuroscience guy and you, you don't really have a pocket full of physics to talk about. But in the putting zone, because we're so attuned to the physics and the neuroscience, we actually know more than the guy that wrote the book on the brain sense of movement about why it is that way and what it means for the human to run the body instinctively. It means this. If you use that tempo to swing your arms in a putting stroke, the putting stroke will be a pendulum-like swinging that will have three words to characterize the swinging. The tempo, which is the quickness, 
the rhythm, which is the evenness of the tempo back and then through, same tempo back, same tempo through, 950 milliseconds for Lauren Roberts, and then 950 more to the end of the through stroke. That's rhythm. And then the third word is size. And what people in physics usually, I mean, people in golf certainly don't know physics. The one thing about pendulums is the size of the swing doesn't change the tempo or the rhythm. If it takes 1,000 milliseconds for a one-meter-long stick to swing from one top to the other, you can pull the meter stick back from the bottom of a vertical line, pull it back 10 inches and let it go, and it will take 1,000 milliseconds to get to the other side. And then you can pull it 20 inches back and let go, and it will take the same 1,000 milliseconds to get to the other side. And if you pull it 30 inches back and let go, it will take 1,000 milliseconds to get to the other side. The tempo and the rhythm of a physical pendulum does not change because you change the size of the swing. What changes with the size of the swing is the impact velocity at the bottom of the swing, where the peak velocity is expressed right through the bottom of the, of the tick-tock. All right, so brains actually know this. And what brains are doing in putting is it says, you pay attention to where you want this ball to stop across this green speed, that distance, and any uphill and downhill, the three factors that matter. You pay attention and determine and intend like a monkey going to jump from one branch in one tree to another branch in another tree. You intend to do a good job to stop the ball behind the hole so it doesn't go long. And then the instincts, pattern recognition, gives you the correct size of swing that matches that with your tempo and rhythm. But it's using the standard tempo that you're most educated 4,000 times a day with. You're getting a million doses of that tempo, rhythm, swinging, and sizing um, every year you're alive. And so ever since I've been 16 years old this tall, I've got 50 million lessons of that nice, leisurely, relaxed tempo, swinging rhythm. And sizing those. That's why you want to point to somebody's eyeball. There's no question of what you do. You just throw your arm up. That's right. It's by instincts. And, and right, is so that, you're operating. Excuse I, me. I didn't mean to cut you off, but is that why uh, is teenagers are growing and their arms and legs are growing at different lengths and, and the yeah, coordination is thrown right for a complete loop? Years, you know, 12 to 13. You're right. a little bit off, awkward, gangly. Mm-hmm. They have to settle down, you know, and get their shoes fully filled so they can stand upright without stooping and everything. So it's the re-coordination you know, of the longer limb with, with the, the processing yeah. of the brain. Right. That's how come golf gets kind of goofy for 13, 14-year-olds a little bit. They keep changing the length of their clubs. And so, um, you know, the voice is changing. There's a growth spurt in there where human growth hormone is, like, working overtime. Mm-hmm turn you into a, 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 an adult. And and that process starts around, somewhere around 12 and doesn't finish until around 17, 18. You know, so you don't really... It, it, it's kind of like, when did you get as tall as you're ever going to get? It's sort of like that's when you start to stabilize a little bit. Mm -hmm. But the tempo is not really crazy different, even, even though you're going through these changes. Um people's tempos are not really as different as they think they are. Um, everybody's pretty closely somewhere between 950 milliseconds and 1,000 milliseconds of, of just their arm and a putter swinging from one side to the other. If you put it up to the right in the backswing and hold it at the top of the backswing, you say one, two, three, let it swing by itself, it'll take about 950 milliseconds to 1,000 milliseconds to get to the other side. And if you let it do it back and forth, it'll swing about four or five times before it totally dies out. Smaller swings every time, but it'll take four or five of those before it'll die out by itself. All right, so that, that tempo rhythm, that is what the brain wants and prefers to size by the pre-existing wiring of the instincts on how big it goes how far. And you do the monkey thing where you're wide awake, alert, 
You appreciate the green speed as a fact. You appreciate the distance as a fact. You appreciate the contour and any net uphill, downhill difference of ball to hole as a fact. And you say, intend to do a good job, not any short, not any crazy long, ready, set, pull the trigger, make tempo twice, ding, dong. And the size instinctively happens. So let me unpack that just a minute because people don't get that. The monkey part is what picks the right pattern for this putt, for how big the swing should be. And that derivatively will pick the impact velocity of the putter head on the back of the ball because size determines impact velocity. The brain knows all that. It's already lived that thousands of times forever. And if you've been playing golf for a while, it just builds on what it already knows and just fills a little chapter book on putting and puts it on the shelf for you. It's all in the instincts. It's already there. The wiring is not any problem solving. It's not any kind of solutions. It's not any kind of you figure stuff out that other people don't know. None of that. It's just intend and you got the size. All right. So here's what happens in between monkey gives you the size and you pull the trigger with tempo twice. The brain says, what muscle are we going to use to make your backswing? And if you make a shoulder stroke or a right-handed golfer does the shoulder, left shoulder down, that's going to be the left side inner oblique attaches the rib cage to the hip. And you contract that, it pulls your shoulder vertically down like a crunch motion. If you use an arm swing, there's two ways to do it. One is to pull back with your right, either with your arm or your elbow. If you do it with your arm, with your armpit, there's a muscle that wraps over the top of your shoulder down the side outside of your upper arm. And when you contract that one, it's like pulling the bucket up out of a well. It pulls your arm away from you um, to the side of your body. That's a dorsal muscle. The preferred way to do it is to not use the rear hand, but to use the front arm. And the muscle that pulls the front arm across the middle of the body into a backstroke is the pectoral muscle. The pectoral muscle of the left arm is going to connect the bones of your rib cage just above the heart across to the upper bones of the upper forearm. And when you contract the pec muscle, it'll draw your lead arm across the body. All right, so the brain knows which one you're going to use because you got to have it. And it says, <clears throat> okay, you're going to use your left pec muscle to draw your left arm across your body, and that's the backstroke. So the brain will energize the muscle in advance the same way you put gas in the car that's got to go a certain distance. The whole amount of gas that the brain puts into your muscle action in advance is designed to get you more than 99% of the way to the distance, not short. And then if you get there, don't crash through the wall with 110% energy. So somewhere between 99 and 110% for the given situation of distance, green speed, uphill, downhill, the brain will give you the gasoline that drives you right to the edge of the cliff, but not over. The cliff is three feet past the hole, but two feet is good. Two feet past the hole is good. So your monkey monkey is get to the hole, never short, never too far past. And then your brain fills the gas tank with eight gallons of gas because eight and a half will drive you over the cliff. So you don't have eight and a half. You don't have 110%. The brain instinctively will protect your hand from smashing against the doorknob by saying that would be terrible. Overshoot is the worst possible thing to do in putting, to go way past the hole. All right? So the brain eliminates that and gives you what I call 103%. that will get you either in the hole or behind the hole. Now, that's 10 seconds in advance. The brain will do that as long as you stay in the shot and intentional to the space. Monkey Monkey tunes you to the actual space of the putt, and Cow Cow says, use everything you got. You need to use all eight, eight gallons to get all the way to the edge of the cliff. And so Cow Cow is just one tempo, two tempo, and the size just happens because it's it's the gas in the muscle that makes the size. 
the way you throw a basketball up for a, for a jump jump off uh, at the beginning of the game, mm-hmm. where you, where the referee tosses it up with his hand, or the way a tennis player tosses the ball up for a tennis serve, the vigor of that muscle contraction sets the size of how far that ball goes in the air. And the same thing happens with your brain instinctively to tune you to the space with 103% energy, monkey, monkey. The cow cannot possibly go long because there's not enough gas in the tank to make the stroke that big. That's distance control. And it doesn't matter whether you're on marble or carpet or stemp 10, stemp 12 greens. It matters whether you just appreciate it is what it is and deal with it. Then your instincts are going to size the swing appropriately. They're going to give you the impact velocity that matches the requirements of the external physics of the world. Ta-da! Didn't know the brains do that. Yeah, they do. They give you exactly the solution of the impact velocity that is required by the green speed, the distance, and the uphill downhill. And it does it all the time. And housewives can do it better than professional golfers because they don't have shrapnel, other thoughts that they think are right. So you're operating the body at an instinctive level by monkey, monkey, cow, cow, and that's kind of stupid. But it's something the 10-year-old can do, and it's neuroscience of the highest level. It's 25 years of neuroscience research boiled down into monkey, monkey, cow, cow. <laughs> now you can talk more and more about it, how to teach it, you know, and how to talk about tempo and what it is and how to do it and whether that was good or not. But basically, at some point, the golfer has to do the skill of intentionality to the space, paying attention, plus swing twice with tempo. Did it match tempo slow and casual? Was it the correct tempo? And was it twice, back swing, forward swing twice? If that's true, you, you've got distance control all together. And there's like, um, what is the tempo? It's the quickness. Slow down. If you lift your hand away from you and let it swing back across in front of your body, that's the tempo. That's the 1,000, 4,000 pounds a day tempo. If you don't uh, spend a lot of time talking and walking, you just sort of stand still and enjoy the breeze on your neck or the sun on your face, the tempo is easy. If you're not anxious about going somewhere, getting somewhere and doing something else, you stay in the putt. You're, you're in focus. You're in the zone. And you're slow motion because you're a cow. You don't have anywhere to go. You're perfectly happy to be there. You're working on what you need to be working on. You've already done the monkey monkey thing, and now you got 10 seconds of full, full-bodied leisure to just whenever you feel like starting your little back and through swing, go ahead and join the music. All right, so teaching that is like you take a, a, a handkerchief, a two-by-two two handkerchief, and pin it behind the hole. And then you take a tape measure and pin zero right beside the hole and then pull the tape measure 30 feet out across the green. And you say, let's go to 10 feet. All right, two, two golf balls. Monkey, monkey, stop ball on the carpet, not past, not past the back of the cloth. Do not go past the back of the cloth. All right, miss the hole. So you can see whether how you do on the cloth. Put two golf balls on the cloth. Monkey, monkey, stop on the cloth. Now make cow, cow swings and see the size will happen. Then you get two of them onto the onto the anchors. If you back up five feet to fifteen, and you repeat the process. Monkey, monkey, cow, cow. A bigger size happens. And two balls go onto the cloth and they don't go off. They don't go past the cloth. They're not short and they're not past the cloth. And you back up to 20 and you repeat it again, monkey, monkey, cow, cow, two swings, ding, dong. Balls go on to the cloth, perfect. You go to 25 feet, you go to 30 feet. When you finish all that, that's 10 putts, and your size has changed every time you backed up. But the process is always the same. Monkey to the space, stop, 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 right by the hole, and then cow, cow, your instincts will size the swing. So, so the, the the monkey part of it is the formulation in the body and the brain, and the it's cow is intentionality of the body to the space. Yes, and let me distinguish that from a student thinking he's figuring out what to do. You're not a student when you play golf. You're an animal. You happen to be called a human, and that's a handicap because you've got a mind. We're not operating the mind. We're only using the mind to make us act like a monkey 
that's going to move his body in space to an intentional space. It's intentionality. Intentionality is what all animals do when they move. They move towards an, an object or a location. Intentionality does not require language in your head, does not require words in your head, does not require a, a rule to solve a problem with. It does not require self-talk. It does not require confidence. It does not require any of that human baloney that makes you less than a good animal trying to make a putt. Now, humans are good at putting. I mean, they're better than monkeys. Um, there's some things that other animals do better for movement, but humans are pretty good animals for movement. They can climb steps. They can walk across uh, logs across a creek. Uh, they can throw uh, spit balls and, and fast balls and curve balls. They can throw touchdown passes. They can hit tennis shots to an inch. Blah, blah, blah. They can throw darts in the middle of the dartboard. They're good. All right, so, but it's, it's not a human language thing. It's not a problem solving thing. And so you got to stay out of your mind. Don't go into your mind. Operate your body. So the mind is only there to keep you on task operating the body, monkey, monkey, cow, cow. As soon as you get in there with your mind and you say, I think the size of that swing is getting too big, you will completely mess it up because the mind does not know anything. The body is already wired up by 28 PhDs in physics over a 10, 15, 20-year experience of trial and error getting it right. The actual physics answers are already wired up. How much do you swing your arms to make this putt work? It's instinctive. Now, that means it's non-conscious. That means it's part of the body part. The brain is operating like an organ, like a kidney. It's not operating like a mind, like a little self-talk studio where you go in there and start talking to yourself and drawing numbers on the board. <laughs> it's, it's not, don't do that. All right, so all, everybody always wants to do that. And, and you know, it sounds a little Hank Haney-ish about it. The people from India are very mental. <laughs> and Koreans are terribly mental. They're harder to teach than the dumb rednecks from the South from the Anglo-Saxon American South. <laughs> you know, the more shrapnel, the harder you, the, the more you're convinced that brain smarts in classrooms has gotten you where you are, the harder it is to teach that person distance control because they're just wedded to their mind and they've stopped being an athlete. So my particular skill of teaching is, is to talk about big boy putting, shame on you for coming out here like a student when you need to be an athlete. And, yeah, go over there to the side of the green and spit. Spit like a man. <laughs> Stuff like that. <laughs> you know, to, to convince people that they need to be dumb jocks that know how to operate their bodies on purpose, on command. It's not really a dumb jock. It's like two levels above a jock who's really good. It's a jock who actually knows how to do it every time and knows when they're making mistakes, when you're not really quite that good. And why were they short? Okay, there's two ways to be short. You didn't fully load, and that means that your tempo of the backswing stopped early. It takes a full tempo to load. The brain's counting on you doing that tempo to give you the full load of 103%. You only went and got 97 that's because your mind overruled the tempo and said, that's getting too big. i got to stop it now. That's going to go short. If you get a full load of 103% with the full swing of the backswing taking the full tempo to get there, then if you chicken out with your mind and say, that's going to be too far. It's going off the planet. I better decel. You're only going to spend 97%, not, 80, not 103. And that's short. Those are the only two ways to be short if you're doing good with monkey monkey. You're going to get 103 all day by monkey monkey. Everybody does it. Everybody gets it. Housewives, children, little girls, little boys, big boys, little boys, old boys, men that never played golf in their lives, they can get that fast. It's golf professionals who think they know golf channel stuff that are the ones that are hard to teach. But basically, monkey monkey, you'll never go long. And the only way you can possibly go long is the 
third rule of bad distance control. You fully loaded, and then you zipped the second half of your swing, and you got 103, but you spent 120. If is, your second is half it, of your swing is, yeah. Is it 103 but, because you, you, you want to go slightly more passable? More than 99. Yeah, you want to get more than ninety nine because that'll stop on the front zip. Right, or or is it or is it to, it's to go past? Hundred ten is what goes way past. Right, and, and and it's not because you're losing energy through impact of the ball, the, the loss of energy well, between you can the, the club them head and ball. Short, but you don't ever go long by deceling. No. You go you go long by speed and second swing up the second half of your forward swing. If the second swing doesn't match the first swing for for pace and timing and quickness, mm-hmm. uh, you're dead. You're gone way past. If you speed up the second swing, you're you're dead. Yeah, I see that a lot. Where where people will cut the back swing mm-hmm. short and then really speed up, and they, well, why do I have this? Well, so they're doing issues? they're doing no they're shit. doing mixing and max. Mm-hmm. They're, they're maxing, mixing and matching socks in the in the, in the dark. When when you stop your backswing from fully loading, you then go, uh oh, now I got to speed up to make up for it. And so you go short back, quick, quicker through, right? Mm-hmm. That's like violating three rules at once or two rules at once. Never, ever do you do the second swing faster than you did the first swing. That's the first mandatory rule of distance control. Never, ever get into that short back quick through crap. Stop that. You will beat the socks off of everybody you know, and you'll be the next Ben Crenshaw that went 368 holes without a three putt. Other golfers can't do that because they don't know this. Do not ever make the second swing any faster or quicker than the first swing. Now, if that rule is in place, and you make a short backswing that didn't fully load, you can't go faster because you got that rule in place. Mm -hmm. You can't do the second one faster because you really believe this is true. And it is true. It's basic human neuroscience of movement. As long as you make an even tempo back and through, the brain will never give you 110% energy. You can't have that. That's terrible. Brain, you'd die if the brain gives you that overshoot energy where you're smashing your hand against doorknobs and smashing your face against walls and crap. You'd be dead in three weeks if, if the brain doesn't stop that. So early in your life, you had some bad experiences with pain and injury by overshoot, but that kind of cleared up pretty quick. But all monkey monkey eliminates the possibility of going long, plus that second rule, never second half a swing faster. Now, you can't possibly go long, so the whole thing shifts when you're a cow into use everything you got or you will be short. Load 103, don't stop the tempo. Spin 103, don't desell the tempo. Tempo twice. Load the whole thing, spin the whole thing. The cow is categorically different than the monkey. The monkey is wide awake, intentional, worried, determined, and paying attention to everything that matters. And then you have a 15-second grace period where you got changed into a luxurious cow that don't give a rat and is just swinging his tail in the field and feeling the sun on his skin. Ding dong. The size is not anything you want to ever pay attention to. The size is instinct. As soon as you mentally start judging and paying attention to the size, you're going to screw it up. Bad, bad. And so the, the, the rules uh, and the knowledge of how the body actually operates instinctively, that will make a professional golfer make twice as many cuts. Steve Elkin and I taught him this one thing. He went from 48% cuts to 78% cuts. That, making the cuts, will triple your money. Making the cuts will also make you have a lot higher top 20s and that will make you a whole lot higher chance of actually winning tournaments. So w- one lesson for professional golfers is monkey cow. None of them know this unless I've taught them or one of my students has taught them. They don't know this, and so they're inconsistent. They're streaky. They have streaks and they have um, slumps. They don't know how to get back in the saddle. It takes usually about three weeks to get over a slump. 
before your better putting comes back into play. And you don't really consistently putt extremely great distance control over a long period of time. Do, do, do you think that now, the, the length of the putter has an effect on that? For, for example, somebody's got too, too long a putter. Yeah, that's that's part gonna, of the teaching. That's, yeah, go ahead. You see, so if the length of a putter is too long, that then you've got more resistance. Well, it depends on what happens with their arms. Right. All right, if, if the putter is sitting there, the, the flatness of the bottom of the putter sets the angle of the shaft coming up off the green. Right. Let's mm-hmm. just say you're on a, a dead level green, like a floor in a in store somewhere. You make the the putter flat to the deck, then the lie angle is going to present the handle, however long the shaft is. Let's say you got a 35 inch uh, shaft, and so the 10 inches of putter grip material is 35 minus 10 inches. It starts at at inch 25 up the shaft. And then it goes to inch 35 on the shaft, right? Right. Now, that putter is sitting there. And let's say that somebody's put their foot on the putter head to hold it flat to the green. If you walk up to that handle and hang your arms, what all golfers in the planet do ignorantly is they reach for the middle of the handle and call it good. Now, for most people, phys- their physiology and their anatomy, that's not where their hands hang. Their hands hang lower than that by about three inches. So, number one, do you value the arm hang to make your straight back and straight through stroke? And the answer is, if you have your hands up in the air artificially to position them on the handle because some dumb wad handed you too long of a putter, your hands have play in the system where you can stub your putts. You've, you've got, still got play left in your system, and that play might lengthen the swing of your putter head further out there while you're in the back stroke coming down, and then the next thing you know, you pop the ground short of the back of the ball. That's a stub. All right, so hanging your arms all the way out gets a lot of regularity into your swing and eliminate stubbing. So that's number one. Is don't 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 accept the invitation of the putter handle because some doofus designed a putter that doesn't match your body. Now, all the time I'm taking people's hands off their putter and then they put them right back where they came from and I'll pull them off again and then I'll tap their lead arm in the elbow and say, let that thing relax. Relax that arm. And they'll say, well, it is relaxed. I said, no, it's not. Relax it. And then they'll drop it. It'll go down three inches further. And then I'll push their relaxed hand back over to the handle, and it'll be down at the bottom of the handle material, not in the middle. So most putters don't fit people. Most putters mess people up. Most putters engender bad setup postures. Most putters engender bad physics of how to swing the parts of your body. The two arms of your body... um, typically for an adult male, or they're on the order of seven and a half pounds each. So that's 15 pounds of arms. Mm-hmm. The putter is one and a half pound, about. So you're talking about one putter and 10 pounds of other stuff, 10 to 1 ratio of swinging meat versus swinging putter. So postures and arm hanging and all that kind of stuff, it matters quite a bit to the fluid regular, straight, square swinging of the 15 pounds of meat. And putters mess that up all the time. So too long of a putter, A, it makes people cock their hands up in the air and crook their elbows, put play back in the system. Now they're swinging some weird shape and they don't know where things relate to each other. This is a, an arm that hangs naturally. It's got that natural little bend in the forearm and the natural little re-bend back down in the vertical of the hands off the end of the forearm. That's natural. If that putter coincides with where your hands hang in gravity with your upper torso bend over and the length of your arms and the length of your legs and everything, that's a putter more properly fit to you. You still have to talk about the lie angle. But where your hands 
come together with fully hanging hands. Where those hands come together, I seldom see putters that are correct. They're always too tall. Yeah, I agree. And the reason I asked that question, when you're talking about the monkey monkey, when that's formulating, uh, pulling in all the information that that it's gathering. um, Right. If I know from the the, the full swing club thing, like, things that you I used can, to do. You can do these. You can putt like this, you know, these weird ways. Yeah. But it's like wearing uh, it's like wearing two tight shoes to the ballet. Yeah, and it it throws your off that, that. You're right. <laughs> you're you're like you said. Your your body and your brain have formulated a uh, its patterning and its movement as right. an animalistic instinct over a long right. period of time, depending how long you've been alive. And if you put an instrument in your hand that's going to disrupt that disrupt that natural movement. Now, now the golfer's right. in trouble because right. they're having to compensate See, kinda, a movement based off a, a ill-fit tool. Where I'm trying to drive people in the direction of, and I don't want to, you know, I'm not, I'm not being insensitive to women golfers because I appreciate them greatly, but just, just to play the little game of, of guy golf, I'm, I'm, I'm headed towards manly golf. By golly, manly golf, just normal putter, normal grip. Pay attention. Do a great job. Swing nice and casual. Don't give a rat. And don't be in your brain, in your mind all the time, judging everything and worrying and peeing in your britches. You know, professional golfers today are, are not, in my book, they're not very manly. Tiger Woods doesn't look like a man to me. He looks like a boy that's got stuck in adolescence about age 24. I mean, his, his behavior has been that way. He's, he's not a man. Phil Mickelson's not a man. He's married and got kids and everything, but he's got this goofy little personality. If you if you threw those boys back into the mix, back with the Hogans and Sneets and those guys, they would look weird. They would not look manly at all. They're too concerned with their color coordinated outfits and you know their endorsement money and their PR guy. I mean, it's, it's like narcissistic Division One rich boys coming out on PGA Tour. There's not very many of them who are actually men, among men. You know, you look at them and say, that guy's a man. Well, they sure as heck used to be a bunch of men out on the PGA Tour. It was rough, tough. And they were they didn't have a lot of shenanigans going on about the golf game. They, they were really working at it. So I'm I'm all in the direction of manly golf or womanly golf, you know, an athlete golf, uh, 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 in the sense of old Greek culture of a rete. The guy that wins the hundred yard dash is famous for the next four years, no question about it. Never has to pay for any of his meals. Gets first line in every line he's ever in. A rete is championship athlete. I'm the guy. And and if you're the guy, you're Walter Hagen. You don't get out there and think it's going to be hard to do this. You're out there saying, I need to make it look hard so people will think I'm really working at it. <laughs> 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 I, I need to make the easy shot look hard and the hard shots look easy. I don't know. To, to, to show me. A couple of times, to Tiger, Phil, and Kepka, DJ, some of those guys now make some of those shots look awfully easy. Well, Tiger's competitive. I'll give him that, but he's he's not playful. He just isn't. No, but don't he, you think that, that that plays he's playful to, when he's off the course? Right. Don't you say it makes him the the seriousness of of his uh, uh, what what he's looking to accomplish. Well, I mean, he ought to know more than he knows. He's, he, he he basically doesn't know much about putting. I mean, his daddy prevented every, every coach he's ever had from talking to him about putting. They put it in the contracts. Mm. Butch Harmon, thou shalt not teach Tiger putting. Uh, Hank Haney, thou shalt not teach Tiger putting. And uh, when Tiger's father died, um, Tiger had 40 putts at the Masters. And he doesn't know what he's doing. Um, he's got certain things that he does and certain things that he thinks but there's certain things that he doesn't know how to explain to a 10-year-old because if he did, he'd be a lot more playful about everything. All these guys out there are, are working hard because they don't know what to do. They're trying this little thing, and then they're trying that little thing, and they're trying a claw grip. Then they're trying the Kuchar clasp it against your arm grip. 
and then there's desperate people trying little tricks and, and, and gimmicks because they don't know the real stuff of big boy putts like a champion. A big boy, he's not out there you know, grinding and worrying all the time. He's out there having fun because he knows how to do great stuff. And he wants people to watch him. If he has to bear down and, and get a little serious every now and then, he can do that too. Do you but, see anybody out there like that now in today's game? Say that again. Do, do you see anybody out there that, that personifies what you're uh, describing well, in today's game? The closest, um, not unless they've been taught by one, me or one of my students. Um, and some of my students, are, uh, they kind of turned against me after they got taught, you know, like David Orr. Um, I got him. I taught him for free, and then I got him gigs at MIT, and then he went up to MIT and told people that my stuff wasn't good science. He thinks I didn't know about that, but I do. He's done that several times. Uh, he doesn't teach my methods. He, he teaches Sam Putlab number guy. He's like a bad science guy. And he doesn't teach how to improve professional golfers. He teaches them how to clean up their acts so they're more consistent or whatever it is they do. That's not improvement. So he worked with... Uh, Justin Rose and Justin Rose won the, won the uh, U.S. Open, and everybody thought, "Oh, great! David Orr knows what he's doing." Well, not really. I mean, if I went to Justin Rose and asked him, you know, what do you do when you do distance control? He's never heard monkey cow because David doesn't teach it. David doesn't know aiming, he doesn't know stroke mechanics, and he doesn't know reading putts. Although he he says he does, and so people like that that have been um, dishonest and disloyal and mean-spirited and ungrateful, uh, I don't have a whole lot of <laughs> hold back when I start talking about them. Um, but if you go ask professional golfers, the uh, one that's kind of close is uh, DeChambeau. What's his first name? Bryson. Bryson, yep. Yeah. Uh, he, he, he's he been coached by a guy named Mike Shy. And Mike Shy was kind of a, a fan of mine for a while, and I was telling the aim point guy about vector putting did it better and earlier than you did. And then putting zone did it better and earlier than you did because we, we fixed the numbers only business that Templeton had. We fixed all that. And here you are, didn't even know Templeton existed. Well, Mike Shy tried to go with aim point and the aim point, uh, Mark Sweeney threw him out for some reason. And Mike Shy went and, um, started teaching vector putting. So Mike Shy has certainly taught DeChambeau some of the stuff that's in vector putting. Now, whether he's teaching him monkey cow, I doubt it, because I don't think he's, he's, he's that much into what I teach. But DeChambeau, has got a, he's got an undergraduate degree in physics, I think. Mm-hmm. And so he believes in what he thinks is science. Unfortunately, he's got the same sickness that everybody else has, which they believe numbers is science. That's not right. You can you can test things. That's good, but you have to test the right things. DeChambeau was testing flagstick in, flagstick out, and he didn't know how to test it because he's not really a good scientist. Um, first of all, you got to do the physics of of how much time the ball has to drop before it hits the flagstick in the middle of the hole. What's the distance? Depends on how thick the flagstick is. Some of them are half an inch thick, some of them three quarters of an inch thick, some of them one inch thick. So you got to know that. How much distance is there across the hole on a center cut putt before the front of the ball hits the flagstick? Answer 1.035 inches. How much time does the ball have to drop before it bangs backwards off the flagstick and then hits the, the wall of the, of the putt, of the cup? And if you don't know that, you won't know that anything that's five revolutions per second across the front lip bangs off a flagstick is not going to have time enough to drop down in the hole. So Bryson DeChambly, or whatever his name is, he doesn't really approach things with the correct scientific investigation. He just says, well, let's get some numbers, and that's called science. And he got misled about that. Leaving the flagstick in is terrible reduces your sinks by 50% if you have decent distance control. If you have lousy distance control, it might save you 
a big comeback 20% of the time, it might cut your comeback from nine feet to four feet. Uh, that ain't no great thing. Why don't you just learn distance control instead? Mm-hmm. You know, so now there's a, there's a Cal Poly study came out and, and, and agreed with what I said by just basic physics analysis of the numbers. So, no, there isn't anybody out there that I know. I mean, I taught Steve Elkington, and he, he went crazy with his putting. He beat Tiger five strokes a day at the uh, Whistling Straits 2010 PGA Championship, and that was all filmed. They filmed all 18 holes of those two guys paired together. And uh, Elkington was 47 years old at the time. He almost won the thing. He was uh, coming in and messed up the last two holes, but he was going for the clubhouse lead, 12 under. And he missed an eagle putt that uh, the commentator said, cellophane, cellophane top. <laughs> it looked like it, it rolled right over top of the hole. It just didn't drop. But the one lesson for Steve Elkington changed his whole life. And then he went and took other lessons from other people because he's a narcissistic, crazy PJ guy that thinks he can fiddle around with anything and it won't hurt him. So he went and took these other crazy lessons about how he twists your arms and elbows and stand close to the hole and all this stuff. And he came out the, in the year 2011 and missing cuts all over the place. And then he quit. Quit golf. Hmm. He tried to play the senior tour and he couldn't putt. So... Even if I've taught them, they don't quite understand that they got to keep up with it. You know, they got to keep doing it. It's just it's pathetic. You know, their their mindset is I'm I'm a DNA creature and I'm a thoroughbred, and you know if I take a little lesson from somebody it helps me. It wasn't really the lesson; it's just my thoroughbred coming out, and I can go take other lessons and they won't hurt me. That's the way they think, and it's bad. It's it's just stupid yeah i, I was so, I, I was almost guilty of that being uh you know mm-hmm. growing up being an athlete playing at high levels and then when i played pro golf or at least got started right. out in it i i had somewhat of the same idea and, until i got my clubs fit by someone who really knew what they were doing it was all based off neurophysiology um right. and, and so on and i was i i, I got a wide uh eyed awakening to to what someone who really knows the application of science and the multiple sciences and how to not only that but how to apply it to individual golfer um, right. it, it, it was i mean let i me, average let i think let me tell you about um let me tell you a little bit about um club fitting the human body and tempo and um, grip pressure <laughs> if 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 the lie angle of the putter matches your natural hang of your forearm mm-hmm. it would be 14 degrees back off of vertical or measured up from the ground, 90 minus 14 would be 76 degrees upright, which is four or five more upright than a standard today. I think it's even more. Standard's gone flatter. Um, it's what? On four, yeah, I think standard has gone down to 70 uh, on some of the, some of the major OEMs. For, yeah, from I know, not, from I know I'm they're measuring. making the big mistake because they don't know anything. I know that. I just didn't know that David Adele designed his putters at 68 degrees, and he's completely stupid. Let me describe to you what torque is. Torque is if you took a a, a, um, a putter shaft without a putter head on it and you stuck it in a melon straight down vertically towards the ground and you stabbed the melon with the end of your shaft. Mm-hmm. And then you tried to lift that melon away from your feet until it was horizontally held above the green. That's torque. The torque force is the, the mass of the melon trying to push that putter back to vertical. Now, as you lift it away from vertical towards horizontal, and if you go a little bit, that that's one torque. And then you have to increase the torque to go further. And the maximum torque is the one that holds it horizontal to the green. Right? Putter heads are just like a shaft stuck in the melon. There's a mass down there called a putter head. Anywhere from 325 to 400 grams. Now, what that mass does, nobody in golf seems to know because they're, they design putters ignorantly and they design tests of putters and they claim stuff about putters completely ignorant of the torque fact. The fact is the putter sitting down there flat on the green with 70 
20 degrees off vertical to make it a 70 flat Y angle. That's, that's, that's like six flatter than it should be, according to your arm. And so when it comes back to your arm, the, you have to change angles. The putter angle and the arm angle, it doesn't matter. It doesn't match. The arm angle is a lot steeper down, and then the putter 70-degree line angle is a lot flatter. So you have a little V-shape down there where your hand hits the putter. Mm -hmm. Well, that putter's sitting on the ground about nine inches away from your feet. And as soon as you push it back into the air and the ground is no longer holding that torque, torque is going to start drooping in towards your feet. All right? Right. Now, the way to test this is to, is to set up to a putter that's flat to the ground, flat lie angle, bend your arms down to where they connect to the putter without any play left in them. And then your upper torso, pretend like it's a crane at a construction site, and you just lift your, the base of your neck up in the air and pull your arms up with them. As soon as you pull your arms up, the putter comes off the ground. That putter swings right back to the middle of your feet into a vertical direction. That's torque. Okay? Now, it happens, and you didn't do it, so it must be physics. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. the, the mass of the putter head makes it droop towards your feet. Now, if that's, a, if that's like the melon that you just stabbed vertically with your putter shaft, and now you got to put it back where it came from, grip pressure on a scale of 1 to 10 in your left hand or your lead hand, if you go from 0 to 1, you might be able to push that putter head back about a third of the way from where it came from. If you go to level 2 of grip pressure, you'll get it two-thirds of the way. And if you go to level 3, you'll be able to put it back where it came from when it was flat on the green before it ever drooped towards you. Now, that grip pressure, 3 on a scale of 1 to 10, is not a stranglehold, but it is a firm grip. It's the same grip that you would have if you shook a friend's hand and your thumb trapped them in the, sh in the handshake. Yeah, you're your losing touch and feel, aren't you? No, because touch and feel is, is not real. Put it velocity and impact is real. Tempo is real. Timing is real. The sensitivity in your fingers is irrelevant to the putter head impact and how far the ball goes. Mm -hmm. got, got news for everybody out there. The only real thing on how far the ball will go is putter head velocity head impact. The only real thing that generates that is the instincts for the size of the swing. Hand grip pressure does not hurt that whatsoever. Okay? Now, if you grip it so hard on a scale of 1 to 10, you get it up to 8 or 9, what will happen is your armpits will start clenching because you just infuse tension all the way up your, from your hands into your forearms, your upper arms, and now even into your shoulder uh, assembly. You've got muscle pressure squeezing going on up there. That might mess up your touch. But feel, what a word is that? Who knows what that means? All right, so that's like nothing. So if you grip it to a three, and then you do tempo twice swing, throw it back, let it swing. That will have beautiful touch, and you'll be operating your body as an athlete big boy, knowing what to do to make your body monkey cow. Monkey, let's go there, let's putt. Cow, let's swing twice, bang. The grip pressure is what prevents the stroke from drooping into your feet when you push it back. Now, if you push back, with your muscle contraction and you draw your left arm across your body, that's not going to curve to the inside. That doesn't go curvy. That goes across the middle, of, across your body straight. So if the putter curves to the inside, that's because your weak hand is too girlish, too weak, too light, too one instead of three. If you make a stroke over top of an aiming stick on the ground with a one grip pressure, it will curve to the inside massively after 20 inches of the backswing. It'll be five inches off the line, wide open. If you put a two-grip pressure into your hand and repeat that stroke with your muscle contraction pulling your arms across your body, it'll go three inches or two and a half inches offline to the inside and up and up. 
be about half as bad as it was when you had one grip pressure. If you put a three on there and then contract your muscle to swing your arm across your body, it won't come off the aiming stick. It'll stay on the aiming stick. Okay? It's mm -hmm. just physics. Now, anybody who thinks that the arcing stroke is a natural athletic stroke and you don't have to do anything and the putter will stay on plane with the stroke curve and all that, completely nonsense, don't know what's causing what. What's causing it is too light of a grip pressure is letting the putter fall off a ladder. It's gravity and it's physics, and it's because you didn't grip it tight enough. All right? A three is not a killer grip, but it's the minimum. you got to have at least three or else it's going to droop on the inside. Now, if you fell off of a ladder, what in Luana's name makes you think you're going to fall back up the ladder correctly to re-square <laughs> that putter impact? Right? right. Now, golfers that, that teach all this, they're, 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 they're not smart enough to actually know that's what they're saying. They're stupid. But they're actually telling you that if your putter arcs to the inside, that's athletic, don't worry about it. It's going to re-square itself coming forward. Then what's the next thing they teach is, oh, also you have to learn how to rotate your putter through impact so you'll close it correctly. <laughs> mm. This is what Tiger's been doing for years now. He's been, been losing his putter face to the inside because he's too weak with his grip. Because he thinks, like you just said, it's touch and feel, touch and feel. No, it's not, dumb bunnies. <laughs> if you if your putter swings to the inside, it's because you're weak as a little girl holding that putter because you got stupid ideas in your head about touch and feel. You're, mechanically, you're just creating a problem. Now, if you don't know that, that practicing toe release through impact is inconsistent with your idea that this arcing stroke is natural and athletic and, and it's going to re-square itself, you're just major ignorant. You don't even belong in third grade. It's completely inconsistent to, to work on rotating the putter face close through impact. You created the problem with the weak grip pressure. Stupid. So <laughs> okay. the, the grip pressure for any golfer should be at least three. Yeah, it's enough to angle the putter to work. It's a tool. Pick it up. Don't pick it up halfway. <laughs> so e e even it's even like, if even if the putter's seventy six degree line, go it, it should. Yeah, be we're three. we're going to get to that point now. Now comes the big point. Big boys don't care about properly improperly fitting putters with too flat a lie because they know the little rule about grip it. Your problem. Grip pressure will, three on a scale of one to ten will handle bad putter designs. Too flat of a lie. Right now, if you say, well, what will, a, will a, a more proper lie angle do to give you a performance boost? And the answer is, even if you made the putter match the lie angle of your forearm, you will improve the way it sits in the palm of your hand. The edge of the putter handle will now align with the lifeline of your palm. Mm-hmm. Whereas if the putter handle is flat to your hand angle, hand angle, the putter at the edge of the putter handle will will move from the base of your index finger to the butt of your palm, and it will not follow the lifeline. It'll be so called in the fingers. Right. All right. So um, it'd be more like a full swing grip in the fingers. Mm -hmm. And the so. If you've got a putter to match the line of your natural hang of your forearm, 14 degrees out of vertical, 76 upright, that will make your hand hang angle a little nicer, but you still got to grip at least a one on a scale of one to 10. So you're, you're basically, you still got the same responsibility. Will that improve your accuracy for line control and distance control, now you, you have to be the guinea pig gets tested with a thousand putts this way and a thousand that way and see whether it makes much of a difference. My experience is it won't make much of a difference. So big boys 
I, when they all start going, I got to get a putter fitting. I got to get a putter fitting. I said, first you need to swing a bad putter and do it well. Big boy swings a little stick, not the other way around. Big physics, banging your chest with your finger. Little physics pointing dismissively at the putter. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, it's like 15 pounds of swing in one. 15 pounds of arms of swing and one pound, one and a half pound of putter. Big physics. Grip pressure completely eliminates putter droop. The arcing stroke is completely misguided, doesn't exist, creates problems, and they don't know how to rotate the putter face closed anyway. But bigger strokes is more rotation. Change your grip pressure. You're going to get more rotation. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be the same rotation every putt. <laughs> If, if your grip pressure varies at all, your rotation is going to change. That's because you're falling off the ladder farther and harder. If the putter is if the putt is longer, your rotation is going to be different. If your tempo is quicker, your rotation is going to be different. Your opening and closing rotation. If you ever change your ball position, you're going to mess everything up. All right. So this this little system of, of fall off the ladder and then rotate your putter hits your impact is colossally problem in generating it's just creating problems for no damn reason whatsoever yeah hard too hard just, to too too many variables to be consistent yes yeah, it's, it's crazy so you want to improve a golfer you tell them to quit that <laughs> and, and if he says i've been doing it for years i said that's why you suck for years. <laughs> you know, there's another 20 percent improvement that's right here in front of you and if you're too stupid to try for it go away and get some other teacher because i don't teach people how to do what they're doing if you I teach people how to get better if you had to 10 times someone's productivity in one tenth the time that they had to do it, okay, like today's society, right? Everybody's going 10 different directions. Or, or I guess right. an easier way to say it is, you know, somebody's working, they're, they're an entrepreneur, they're building a business, they got a family, but they're, they still love golf. But they've got, they, they, they can play still once a week, but they've got, let's say, 15 to 30 minutes in the evening to practice. And they come to you and say, Jeff, I, I need something to make me a better putter. What is it right. that you tell them to focus on? Uh, and I know well, every, and everyone's different. Say make strokes, make strokes in your house in front of a wall. Mm -hmm. Sit up in front of a wall. That will automatically give you a good sense of straight, sideways, and square setup, and square body positions in relationship to the aim of the putter face. The aim of the putter face is parallel to the wall. When you set up to a wall you automatically will face the wall with your chest and your chest and your shoulders will parallel the aim of the putter face. Your arm action, when you pull your arm back and then through, you'll quickly learn that some funny stuff happens in the backstroke, but hell, your name is Dan Marino. You're throwing touchdown passes that way towards the target. You can fix all that if you know what has to happen through impact. Straight through the ball for pass down the aim line, straight through the ball, down the aim line for pass. That's where your arm's naturally going to swing towards the target. And same putter face orientation as you had at address. Why mess all that up with crazy, stupid stuff in the backswing? Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you put along the base of a wall, you're going to get a, a, a lot better stroke, and you have to kind of know what it is you're trying to do. You're trying to hit the ball where you aim. Underline, circle, ball play. <laughs> so, Nobody says that. The purpose of the is to tend to where you aim or why bother aim. So everybody, after that. they hear this, we're going to have a bunch of two and a half degrees to the right. We have a bunch of people across the country in their office practicing or putting up against the wall. <laughs> well, good. You know, once, once they get that going, they ought to buy one of those little nine foot gravity return mats. And just sit there and sink 257 putts watching Andy Griffith's show. Mm -hmm. I got one of those <laughs> just sitting in the living room. Yeah. I, I sank like 257 in a row on those things watching TV. Let's uh, let's move to some rapid fire because we're, we're coming up on almost three hours, and I know you got stuff to right, do. Right, I see that. My I girlfriend's giving me the evil eye. Um, <laughs> so, like, <laughs> who, in your, in your, uh, your opinion, who, who, who's the best putter in history? Um, uh, well, probably Bobby Locke. Um, he had an unusual stance and technique that he 
created when he was 13, 14, 15 years old. His whole, but it, it, he was he was very good at reading the last two feet of the putt into the hole. And then he was very good at managing the arrival speed of the ball to the hole from a wide variety of distances. Now, he, you know, he was notoriously slow play. They hated having him in the field because he was so slow. Everybody complained about Bobby Locke loping down the fairways, just won't hurry up. And now you got Brandon uh, DeChambeau guy you know, flipping chart pages in his clipboard trying to figure out what to do with the next swing. He slows everything down, too. But Bobby Locke's body was slow. He was like a cow. He was just walking through. The, he just would not be pushed by anybody. And so he had great distance control. When you have great distance control, you can read putts better because there's only one line, one curve of the break that will show up when your brain predicts with one good, smart ball speed that you're familiar with and you, that you can execute. So it's easier to read putts when you have that kind of nice tempo distance control. Mm-hmm. And it's easy to sink those putts because then you just pull the old plan A out and hit it where you're aiming with the, with the, and pace every putt the rest of your life. And he was, he was a master at, at, he just completely destroyed the psychology of Pennsylvania because Ben Hugging was always going, I'm a ball striker. I can stick it closer to the hole than anybody. And he kept sticking it closer to the hole. And Bobby Locke would sink a 30-footer and just deny his ass. <laughs> <laughs> Hug would be looking at a 6 for, for birdie, and, and Bobby Locke would be looking at a 35-footer. And Bobby Locke, of course, would putt first, and he'd sink it. <laughs> Great equalizer. Hugging, it just drove Hugging insane. He couldn't stand it. And so, you know, Locke won five majors. He wasn't really welcome in the United States, and they, the PGA Tour players made it known that they didn't want to see his back. So he, he won, I think he won four British Opens or something, maybe five. So he's like, and he, he, he was probably the best at doing it, but he didn't really know how to talk about it. All right. Horton uh, Smith wrote a pretty good book. Uh, Walter Travis Jr. Uh, wrote a pretty good book. Walter Travis is the guy that used to connect to these metal center-shafted putter in 1904 to win the British Championship Championship among the gentlemen, rich people of England. Mm-hmm. And uh, they were so pissed off that he won that they accused him of cheating with this Schenectady putter. And they demanded that the RNA rule that putter a cheat and the illegal club. And then they forwarded their demand to the USGA and demanded they follow suit uh, as the second lesser cousin of the RNA. And that was the first conflict between the USGA and the RNA, and the USGA wouldn't do it. They split with the RNA on that issue. Hmm. But Walter Travis had a whole lot of little drills. I was a little business of uh, putting 100 in a row without missing one or start over. He's the nutcase that started that. He started a little holes in the green. There was a friend of mine that sold this thing called the Sure Putt Cup, which is like a two-inch diamond or golf yeah, hole. Yeah, I've seen a few of those. Yeah, and he sold, he sold the, the cutting tools to make those holes. Walter Travis had those at Garden City um, Golf Club in Long Island back in 1905. And he was a good writer. The, thing, the thing about Walter Travis was he was a 155-pound, 35-year-old man had never played golf because golf was brand new when he took it up. Golf in America was the 1890s. So he took up golf, and he said, I'll never be a long ball either, so I better work on short game putting. And so he's the first master class of um, putting. Walter Hagen was great. Great putter. So did you say uh, Locke and then was one? Walter probably, Travis, probably Travis. Probably two? Yeah. And Hagen, maybe uh, three. Horton Smith was great. Hagen, Hagen is, depends on who you ask. Um, Hagen was a fabulous putter, but he was, he was a showman and a goof. 
uh, Walter Hagen was, um, you know, the um, the U.S. Open where Francis Weeman, the assistant mm-hmm. club pro, beat the master blasters from England, Harold, uh, I mean, uh, Voss, Larden, and uh, Ted Ray. He beat them in a 36-hole playoff. Right. Well, Walter Hagen, that was Walter Hagen's first U.S. Open. He came in fourth. <laughs> <laughs> Very first time he ever tried the U.S. Open, and the the next year, in 1914, he won. It's it pretty good. And uh, Walter Hagen was a baseball star in in the day where golf was nothing compared to baseball, not for money or anything. And he had a ready made career in baseball handed to him, and he refused to take it. And they said, "What are you going to do?" He says, "I'm going to play golf." I said, "Why?" He says, "Cool clothes, <laughs> silk shirts, <laughs> spats." <laughs> Argyle sweaters. <laughs> so <laughs> he was he was a bit of a goof, but boy was he ever a, a, a match play competitor murdering guy. He murdered his competition with trash talk. Good good humored natured, but it was like uh, you know, John Wayne Gacy telling a joke while he's slitting your throat. <laughs> 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 that didn't come across all that kind to the people he was competing with. If, but he was a he was a fabulous putter. If, if let me go to the next one then. If uh, if you weren't a putting theorist, you'd be a what? Me personally, mm-hmm. I'd be a uh, I'd be a nurse in somewhere. Cool. I like to help people. I've noticed. That's my deal. <laughs> it is not about getting paid. If I could teach, that'd be good. If I could nurse, that'd be good. If somebody would just ask me how to do something better, I, I like that kind of free floating. Um, guy that just sticks an oar in here and there and tries to do things better. Mm-hmm. Every every time I look at something, I instinctively want to you know think about how to do it better. It's a good trait to have. And help people. Yeah, and help people. You know. All right. I just uh, kind of were. I mean, I never cared enough about money to actually be successful with the money part. So. Well, hopefully enough people listen to this. I'll be calling you for lessons. <laughs> Oh, that's great. Help on that money. You want to give him my email? Yeah, well, we'll get to that pretty soon. Uh, A few more on the rapid fire. Uh, Mallet or blade putter? Mallet or blade putter? Uh, The putter. I'm not going to Would you you, like like these oversized? A little bit better. A mallet has a little bit more secure connection of the putter's body to the deck of the green. Mm Mm-hmm. And so... But if you get the mallet too big, it sort of messes up your the, the up and down of your swinging. You can mm-hmm. kind of bump the bottom of a mallet because it's too wide. So mallets have to be modest mallets and not a whole lot of lines and stuff on them. Um, I use blade putter an awful lot. I mean, I got lots and lots of 8802s and George Lowe's and Odie Christmans and all kinds of stuff. I mean, all I can find, you know, it's just big board grips it, big board putts it. Yep. All right. Um, so let me get my email so if people want. I've got like 30 articles I send out an email, and about 10 of those are like four skills specific, focused. Mm-hmm. And if anybody wants any of those or they want a copy of my book, i got a PDF I can send an email. If you'll just send me an email and tell me your email, my name Email is Jeff Mangum with a dot in between the first and last name at Gmail. And the Jeff is spelled G E O F F. Starts out like George, ends up like Jeff. G E O F F dot M A N G U M, like a monkey, like a man chewing chewing gum, at gmail.com. And send me an email. I'll be I'll shoot you out all these articles and stuff. Yeah, you send me a number. They're they're really good. I encourage uh, anyone listening to uh, to get in touch with you on that. Um, That's great. Let's see. Uh, top three courses on your bucket list. Top three courses on my bucket list. I'm a cow pasture guy. I like it cheap and rough. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. I, I don't feel comfortable around rich people golf. All right. Uh, well, you like prefer? I, I sort of, I sort of thought I wanted to go to you know, Balthasar or something to look at it. I've been to Marion. There's nothing to it, you know. What people claim is great golf it doesn't interest me. It's rich people golf. 
I'm, I'm not into rich people golf. I'm into skills, cow pasture skills, rough golf course skills. Mm-hmm. Good greens are great, but, you know, man up. It is what it is. Show me your skills. All right. How about uh, walking or riding? Uh, I would never ride if, I, if it was up to me. That's why I go to, go to the golf course so I can walk. You know, uh, of all the people I've interviewed so far, everyone has said walk. Yeah. Uh, dream foursome. Dream foursome? Yeah. I don't could... play foursomes. I never play foursomes. Is that right? Too many people play play single and two, singles and two, and occasionally three. All right, uh, I don't let's think say, I've ever played foursome in my whole life. Who, who, if you had to play the three, who, who would be the other two? You pick anybody in history. In history? Mm-hmm. That Anyone I, you want That to. I would like to play with? Yep. Uh, Richard Feynman, the physicist. And let's see, the second person, um, Oprah Winfrey, the entrepreneur who made good. <laughs> now, now, that's two Oprah different Winfrey's people. Oprah has got a kind of attitude. Huh? That's two <laughs> completely different people. That, that's pretty cool. Oh, yeah. Well, Richard Feynman, uh, in his last years of his life, he took up samba drumming and went to Brazil and participated in the samba parades. Mm-hmm. And uh, he took up art and was a good draftsman, a good artist. Uh, I don't know what he did with music other than samba, but um, he was way other than just physics. And Oprah, Oprah Winfrey is um, somebody who came out of uh, Kosciuszko, Mississippi, on the Natchez Trace and hit it big in the purple, color purple and then took charge of her own life She's one of the few people that owns her own television production. Mm-hmm. So, it's, it, you know, Johnny Carson did that. Um, she did it. Desi Lou and, and um, Lucille Ball, they did it. But those are the people that got filthy rich from TV. I think uh, Matt Dillon did it. I mean, uh, the guy that plays Matt Dillon, I think he owned his own production team, too. But she she's she made she's about four billion dollars. That's, that's she's a good number. Michael Jordan Michael Jordan is one and a half B. He's not Chicago. Oprah is. <laughs> All right, and, and let's go to the last one. If, if on yeah, the rare sure. occasion you miss a putt, your favorite curse word is what? <laughs> you don't want to hear that. Okay. I've been restraining my curse vocabulary this whole three hours. We'll, we'll, we'll leave that one. To, uh, yeah, I, I just jump straight off into the, into the nasty language book. So to, know, to, 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 to I don't get, really get that upset missing, you know, because part of big boy putting is um, if I missed, it wasn't because I had a crooked stroke or a bad distance control. It was because I didn't read it carefully enough mm-hmm. or didn't aim it correctly. So missing is is the fate that must befall my substandard reading and aiming. And every other golfer on the planet is substandard reading and aiming, and then they're trying to do a substandard stroke and distance control to make it all work out. I call that the, the now what or plan B putting. When you're a plan A putter, you've aimed it so that's got to be right, or unless you can start over, that that's it. But might go in, might not. We're getting ready to find out, but you're certainly not going to mess it up with a crooked stroke or a bad distance control. So a plan A putter is like a big boy. If he misses, he wants to know. He wants to miss because he's not going to have a crooked stroke or a bad distance control. He wants to see what we need to fix the next time. So missing is not like a, a grab your forward and shake your head kind of a thing it's like oh what did i do that i need to get better and if, and if you get stuck in the world where the only thing you're working on is reading and aiming because you've already fixed stroke and distance control you're a one percent golfer for the rest of your life you're only learning reading every single putt. reading 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 you learn so much about reading but you don't learn anything about reading until you quit putting somewhere other than you aim and you quit putting with funny plan B paces. You can't judge your read if you do that because then you don't know what, what you, what pace you read with 
and your start line, you didn't even follow your start line or you didn't follow the pace of your reap. It's only when you putt straight with perfect ball speed that you can first time judge right or wrong the read was too high, too low. And if you get stuck in that world where that's all you're working on, you're going to pass everybody by miles. And you're never going backwards and you're only going up. So I don't really shake my head and cuss when I miss a putt. All right. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Anything new you got? You got a, any new books coming out or lectures, schools uh, we can tell everybody uh, about? I just headed to Canada and then setting up a trip. Uh, I'm going to Canada uh, this very coming week. Uh, I'll be driving up there probably Tuesday, Monday or Tuesday, and then teaching Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I might, that'll be in the, the Toronto area at Coppingwood Golf Club. Mm-hmm. And then I'll be moving. I'm probably going to be going over to Ottawa. I'm not sure about that one yet. And then uh, a little bit later in the summer, um, in June, July, I mean, I'll be going for about 30 days into Europe, um, Sweden, uh, Denmark, uh, Holland, uh, Germany, um, Spain, possibly Czech Republic, uh, maybe Morocco, maybe Portugal. Doing schools and lectures? France. France for sure. Huh? Doing lectures, certifications, schools. Teaching, yeah, teaching. teaching clinics, teaching certification, giving lectures. Traveling on trains, staying in hotels, eating funny food. <laughs> When's your next <laughs> book plan to come out? Uh, I got six of them I'm writing simultaneously. Um, one on distance control, one on stroke, one on reading putts, one on aiming putters, one on how to practice and learn, one on putter technology, one on putter fitting putters. And, um, I'm going to try to make it come out of like a series of six, mm-hmm. kind of like a subscription magazine where one comes out. And it's plain and simple, 150 pages, paperback, 15 bucks. And then the next one comes out, 15 bucks. You know, first you do distance control, then you do stroke, and then you do reading press, and you do aiming putters, and then you do how to practice and learn. Like a series like that. And then you get the box set for Christmas. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I got all those. Um, I've, I've written. I write all the time. I've got like eight, eight words easy just on my website. Well, keep me posted and on so those. We'll help you push them out. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm gonna. Uh, uh, if you want to push stuff out right now, you can have my thirty articles push me, and you get some money. You keep it. I let people sell my ebook and keep the money. Um, some guy made six thousand bucks selling my ebook. Yeah, not not, not so my anyway, style to make money off someone else. I. I'd, I'd well, just do it to help to you get it I out mean, there. You I, got good I, stuff. You know, if people pay me ten dollars for my ebook, that's great. If if some kid wants it, I'm gonna give it to him for free. If a college coach needs it and he's not, he ain't got a, too much trouble to get a check written, I give it to him. But you know, um, I'm basically cutting and pasting stuff I've already written, and then I'll be polishing you know one book after another and try to get those out. But if I have any luck at all, they'll be out for the Christmas season, which means you got to get them out in September. Mm-hmm. Well, we'll if, if someone wanted to reach out to you for a lesson, advice, uh, to give a lecture, yeah, uh, how, how do they get a hold of you? Let, let us well, know your two website ways, and your two ways email. The email I already told you. Right. G O F F dot Mangum at gmail dot com. Right. Or my telephone number. Text me or call me. Here code three three six. Three four zero nine zero seven nine, and uh, I'll probably you know I can, I've got a one day driving range of six hundred miles. I can teach you at your house. So you know if you want me to come to Nashville, Tennessee, or uh, Orlando, Florida, or Atlanta, Georgia, or Richmond, Virginia, or Abbott's Town, Pennsylvania, just give me a call. I'll be there in a day. And your website still. Putting Zone? Yeah, puttingzone.com. It's, it's, uh, right now it's being refurbished into a more phone friendly format. But uh, puttingzone.com. Yeah, but people should still check it out. You've got so much info on there that, that, that I mean, they'll be blown away at first. So, so if you're out there listening and you get on Jeff's site, that's puttingzone.com. Uh, don't be um, intimidated because there's so much info. Just, just you got to start someplace. <laughs> well, Take one step at a time. <laughs> It's a big, messy flea market. Of it's a ton of stuff. I, I mean, it was it was yeah, overwhelming for me yeah. at first. Hey, uh, right. Jet, I mean, we we, we got to do this again. I mean, we missed so many things that oh, we yeah, could sit sure. here and talk about for hours. The, the neuropsychological aspect, the the the, uh, right. the neuro processing. Right. 
the eyes, the brain, yeah, the, we, the the position, yeah, the proprioception. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we can go on for hours. But uh, I really appreciate. Your girlfriend's going to kill you, man. Yeah, she is. But uh, <laughs> there's nothing new. Um, hey, th- th- thank you right. so much for taking the time yeah. and providing inf- information you, knowledge Pete. that you That's do. Great. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for listening to today's show. If you enjoyed it, you can find more information on today's episode and other topics at golf. 360.blog. There you'll find the show notes and links links related to this episode as well as any other episode that we've done so far to date. If you're interested in improving your game and would like to learn more from yours truly by taking a private lesson, a half day or multi day school, club or putter fitting, you can reach me through the blog site or by email pete at golf360.blog. So some of you may be asking, what is the golf paradigm? All you have to do is click on the homepage while on my blog site to discover how you can start playing better than you ever thought possible. Or you can simply sign up again on the blog page for my instructional videos where I give regular tips on all areas of the game to include the swing, club design and fitting, health, fitness and nutrition, the mental aspects, and equally as important, the integration of all those things together. I'm also on social media, and you can find me at The Golf Paradigm. That's P-A-R-A-D-I-G-M. And I'm on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel, also under the same name, The Golf Paradigm. Facebook is usually the best.